Now, that type of investment that's looking for gold because real rates are declining will now bleed into equities and they will start at your uh, big producers and then whittle their way down to uh, to uh, the juniors. So what you're telling me, you like silver royalties then? I mean, out of the ones I looked at, uh, Wheaton had the best leverage mm. to precious metals and uh, looked the, like a, a better play. Copper is going to go to the moon, let's say. Mm. Uh, I'm buying a producing company. There's sort of this popular belief out there, I believe, that the Chinese are done in Africa. Like, they had their time in Africa, but now they're going to be moved out. Uh, whoever, whoever said that is full of, uh, you know what, there's no way the Chinese are leaving Africa. Uranium, I do have exposure limited. I have some exposure to rare earths limited, but within the same uranium company. All right, Joe, um, well, you've been on the channel probably half a dozen times or so, so I'm, I'm going to save your times and, 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 the, and people's years from my intros here. And I'll be jumping right into the first uh, topic for today, okay. which is uh, everyone's favorite yellow pet rock. Uh, it's apparently gold is cr crossing an all-time high um, as we speak or cross it this week, as reported by Reuters. And uh, the Internet has exploded with hypotheses and theories about what what this might or could or could not or will not be or what it will be what's your what's your best guess what's the meaning of all this well i mean the why gold is up i mean i, I yeah. think that the the, the the big reason is that people uh have forecast uh, that uh the peak of real rates and i think we've talked about this before but uh, it, it is really the direction of real rates that drives the underlying gold price uh, we've that changed in 2023 uh, since uh, the end of Q1 because there was a lot of central bank buying, which was totally, uh, let's say, divested of, of, of you know of, of what was happening in the equity markets uh, because people only wanted gold. The central banks only wanted gold for diversification, no interest in equities. So mm -hmm. gold was well supported and uh, in an environment of actually rising real rates, which surprised everybody. Uh, because there was no ETF buying, there was no uh, there was no demand from institutional uh, equity people either. Um, so so that demand supported gold. When we would have thought with a stronger U.S. dollar, rising real rates, gold should be going down, but it actually stayed where it was and even actually went up. Mm. Granted, in all other currencies, it was actually doing quite well, uh, and then. We have news that you know that uh, the the real rate uh, the inflation in the U.S. isn't uh, is coming down, and so now the talk is, you know, uh, we're not going to be uh, hiking rates anymore. And so even if we're cutting, even without even cutting, if we have three percent, three and a half percent inflation with no increase in the rates, the real rates will be coming down the direction of the real rates is what's driving the gold price. And so that's bringing investors back into it. And that's what's making the gold price go up. The hope is, uh, is that's now that type of investment that's looking for gold uh, because real rates are declining will, will now bleed into equities and they will start, you know, at your uh, big producers and then whittle their way down to uh, to uh, the juniors that uh, that we look at and and uh, remove some of the financing risk that currently pervades the market. That's the uh, you know the idea, and uh, and we're seeing little pops of that every now and then when we see you know moves to the GDXJ and that and your own favorite gold equity. You know the more levered it is, we're seeing some of those pop which we haven't seen since the end of Q1. Um, the hope is. Uh, which is not a great strategy, is that that, that uh, is the pervading theme for 2024 uh, in the precious metal sector. Mm. That is the hope you put it. Uh, you put it nicely, and and those juniors that we look at, as you said, with uh, with 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 tears in our eyes and and pain in our wallets. That's what I'm interested in, and that's something that I that I wanted to confess to you here. But when I said, "What does this mean?" I didn't really mean didn't. I didn't really want to say what does this mean for the economy or whatever, because I I mostly care about myself I suppose and uh, that's a, that's a good characteristic to have that's what my wife tells me, but I'm I just I'm just wondering what does that mean for me because again much of the leverage as you mentioned has been in the metal alone, 
because the metal is up, GDX is is far 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 away from from its all time highs, and there's uh there's yeah. many theories on why that might be. Uh, you gave me one of those, but where where do you think most of the leverage, or, or maybe intelligently said, where, where do you think the best risk reward will be for gold stocks in 2024? Well, I mean, I, I did this piece in one of Rick Roll's boot camps uh, about royalty companies, and in that, I you know I created this bit of a matrix about how you know. You know, how you invest really depends on you in terms of your own risk profile. And so if your theme is that gold price is going up, then one way, you know, is to buy shares in a gold ETF. Uh, you know, the next range, if you want more risk and more leverage, uh, is potentially going into an equity ETF like your GDX or your GDXJ. Next step is to go into your big producers. They offer diversification. They offer the same kind of liquidity. Now you get paid a dividend, potentially some growth opportunities, but that comes at a risk of capital and everything like that. Then you go down another rung and say, I want even more leverage, more growth. Maybe I go to an intermediate uh, and maybe I want even more excitement in my life and my life isn't tranquil enough uh, that I will go into a junior producer. And then I, 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 you know, I have a psychotic breakdown and then suddenly I, I want to really dig my heels into a junior developer where I have to read a thousand page technical report and not understanding what anything means. And then, then I go to the space where nobody really knows anything uh, is the junior explorer, which everybody's offering me the 10 bagger, uh, but nobody talks about the liquidity risk. So those are the sort of rungs you can go down in terms of investing and just knowing you know how you want to invest what kind of time frame you have is really which one you should pick uh in terms of gaining leverage one thing i would say that i have found you know with respect to royalty companies is sorry another rung that i didn't uh espouse was that you know my impression of royalty companies was they offered diversification uh, you know, you didn't have to worry about a specific royalty because they, you know, they've got royalties all over the world, multiple assets, blending jurisdictional risk and all that. But then when I started digging in to the royalty companies, and this was before Cobra Panama was really getting started, was that I noticed the significant royalty exposure, stream exposure that Franco had to Cobra Panama because that was a huge investment for them. It was as big as their original IPO back in, uh, I think it was 2006 or seven, um, you know, which was over a billion dollars, the biggest IPO on the TSX at the time. Um, yeah, and this this now was over a billion dollar purchase of the precious metal stream of Kobe Panama. Mm. And so the issue with, with royalties, uh, royalty or streaming companies versus a, uh, a a a gold company is that the gold companies most gold mines don't have a mine life more than eight years and so in terms of reserves you're sitting at about anywhere from five to ten years and you can see that in the reserve lives mm -hmm. you know and royalties would not have a longer life than the underlying asset but it's really the streams that the royalty companies do that make them that allow them to show that hey look at the life of these big uh, mining companies, they have got a life eight years. But look at me, I'm 10 to 15. And why they're 10 to 15 is because the streams are on base metal assets that have long lives, like 20 plus years. And it's those streams that really drive a lot of the value, uh, you know, a lot of the differentiation that they have. But those streams are not like a royalty in that the exposure is like, you know, four or 5% of my revenue. These mm -hmm. could be to 20% of your revenue. And such that if something happens to that, suddenly you are exposed to that geopolitical risk. Suddenly you are exposed to expropriation. Suddenly you are exposed to all the risks that the underlying asset have. So if I've got a 1% NSR on a project in Burkina Faso and it gets expropriated, that's fine. That's a 1% NSR in like a, a 50 different NSR royalties I have. But if I've got five big streams that drive, let's say, 50% of my revenue, and one of them goes down, and that you know might be one of the bigger ones, that's a significant exposure for me. Mm. 
So that's something I hadn't realized. And that's something that people should consider when they do some of these royalty companies, because people go in assuming that, you know, the risk is very low. I get a dividend payment. I don't get capital exposure. I don't have geopolitical risk exposure and stuff like that. But, you know, don't be surprised once you look at the asset value breakdown that you just might have a bit of exposure to that, uh, which is what happened. Very good reminder so, here. And then if we look. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I think it broke up, but go ahead. You were going to say, go if we look. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and then we were looking, you were, you were mentioning leverage, and, and that was brought up uh, like Ron Stewart. Uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of ours at Exploration Insights, and he produces a lot of stuff on Twitter and LinkedIn. And one of those things that he put out, uh, and we've got a little chat group as well, uh, he put an all-in sustaining cost versus gold price and then the margin of all-in sustaining cost or AIC margin, you know, over a time series of about 10 quarters or 12 quarters. And, and you could see that the margin peaked, you know, at about 48% during that period. And now it's at about 34, 36%. And then if you look at the gold price, it's going up. But the all in sustaining cost is also going up. So one, you know, might have gone up 50 to 60 percent, but the all in sustaining cost has gone up by about 35 to 40 percent. Um, and so that's the other problem that you have is that you don't have direct leverage because you got a little bit of a handbrake on there because of the increase in cost. And some of that, you know, I dug into because another person in Europe, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Oliver something I can't remember, grow or something like that. He produced this all in sustaining cost, same quarterly thing, but just for Newmont and showing, you know, the changes, the same rise that Ron Stewart showed. But mm -hmm. as I dug into it, there was a step function in that when Newmont changed its gold price that they used to calculate reserves. So it was 1200 for a while. Then they went to 1400 and interestingly enough, the year before when they were at 1200 and they had a sensitivity diagram, they were showing like a 200% increase in their reserves. But in reality, when they did do that increase, it was almost flat. It went from 92.8 to about, I don't know, 95, but 3.1 million ounces of that increase was actually an acquisition when they increased their ownership of Yanacocha. You take that away. And they're almost flat. So that for me was interesting that a company that shows me this sensitivity that's 10 to 15%. And then reality was that their reserves didn't really increase all that much with a $200 price increase. Imagine if they didn't have that $200 price increase, what would have happened to their reserves? And then when you dig into it a little bit more, 20% of their reserves are in their 38% ownership of the Nevada gold mines, which is operated by Barrick. And uh, that actually, the tonnage of that went up and the grade went down. And so these are a lot of big open pits. And so that's a lot more exposure to diesel, a lot more exposure to labor, a lot more milling, a lot more power exposure and all that. And that's where you can see your all in sustaining costs go up. And so it's this kind of digging that you can say that, oh, hey, look, you know, if I just looked at it from... 2022, when they showed me the price sensitivity of the reserves, I go, well, gold price goes to up and these guys raise their reserves, you know, they'll have whatever, 10 million more ounces to put into their reserves, like, like that, you know, and then you go, hang on a second, that's not actually the case. That's not actually how it worked. So uh, that made me think a little, a, a lot about what we forecast, estimate, and what reality is, even in the current market, when there's not a lot of building going on, we're not talking about, you know, the super cycle when, you know, you could buy a truck, but you couldn't get tires for it. And capital kept escalating and there weren't any people. There's still not a lot of people, but for different reasons. I don't remember who said it, but it was someone who said that in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And so that's a quote yeah. that stuck very well with me in 2023 yeah. because it's been very, it's ring very true. But I want to go back to the royalties that you just talked about because that's a very, very important point that I don't hear too many people talk about because it's sort of a, it's just an accepted thing across the industry that royalties are just safe. They're the superior business model. You just buy them, forget them, and that's it. But not brainlessly. 
And that's the point that you're making here is look at the composition. But what else? You look at the composition of where's revenue coming from. Uh, you look at margin. What else do you look at? Well, the thing is, like, I remember when Sandstorm came out and they were saying, you know, hey, we're low risk. We're the best business model. And and they were on Kramer, you know, that that Wall Street show. Mm -hmm. And the, the, all you know is that if somebody's on Kramer, they've already peaked and it's time to sell. Yeah, I mean, that's just a signal, the absolute signal. Just and that was the time. That was the time when they were financing and they started doing a financing. I remember I was working as an analyst then. They did started a financing for 70 to 75 million. They upsized that to 150 million, you know. And and when I looked at the company, most of what where they were getting their money was a stream on a gold project in Brazil. Uh, and it was like a postage stamp. But the reason they were making so much money off of it, and it was such a big part of their valuation or their net asset value, was because you know the the stream was so good for them. But the problem is you got to look at the other side. If it is so good for you, it sucks for the company. And it sucks so much for the company that the company might go under. And then your stream's going to go away. And so they were all touting that, hey, we have no capital exposure because, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to give them any more money. Hmm. But the stream put such a burden on the company that they said, you know what? You only control a stream on this postage stamp. If you guys don't buck up more capital for this project, I'm going to get my ore from over here and your stream won't apply. Mm. And so they had to buck up capital. So you have to think when you're a streamer or a royalty company to not burden your counterparty. Because if you do, and that is a big part of your valuation, that's a risk. Mm. I saw an argument on Twitter Um I can try and look for it, but I'm probably not going to find it. I don't remember who made it, but it was it was a full thing about royalties where someone said that there might be a danger for royalty companies that uh, they were talking about contract breach, basically saying, oh, if the prices go too high or something, yada, 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 the ro royalties that you're hoping are going to get paid based on their royalties or streams are not going to get paid in the way that you hoped them to. Is that a risk you think is realistic? I saw a lot of different opinions on that on Twitter. Well, I guess one of the risks, that I don't know about that one specifically, is the taxes applied to the purchase and sale of a royalty or a stream specifically. Because when you sell an asset, there's a tax, you know, usually, like you're selling something. But usually that happens in a different country. So like, like let's say I'm selling an asset in Burkina Faso, and then they go, hey, you guys changed hands. Somebody made a lot of money, but nothing happened with us. You know, the government, let's say, uh, you know, we still own 10% of the asset, but, you know, nothing changed hands with us. We never got paid. The other problem is a stream and a royalty is part of the asset, but that doesn't get taxed. You know, so you do the stream and then when you're actually producing revenue, the idea was, okay, but I 20% of my revenue, I'm making almost at cost. So I want to pay taxes knowing that 80% is the spot price, but 20% is, you know, under this agreement. That's why I have less margin to tax. But the government can say something like, well, that's your problem, not mine, because you sold that asset. I didn't tax you for that sale. So either I tax you for that sale of that asset, or we're going to take it as 100% that you're getting the gold price. There is no stream because I don't care. You know, that sort of worries me about some, uh, you know, in, in terms of the expropriation or creeping nationalism thing that somebody might scratch their head and go, oh, what the hell happened there? Mm -hmm. You know, now we get less taxes and those guys sold an asset. And then, you know, how does that work? Uh, so, so that's another sort of thing. And that's why they, they always have subsidiaries in the Caribbean and places like that, uh, mm. you know, where all the money goes through, mm. you know, uh, I know tech had that issue, not tech, sorry, uh, Cameco with an office they had in Europe where they were pushing a lot of their revenue through, uh, and then the CRA, the local, uh, revenue agency here in Canada, uh, had a big dispute with them. Mm. Um, Sandy Moss uh, as well had the big tax issue with their uh, stream. 
Uh, and so those are sort of issues that could be problematic. But again, if you break down the asset value, then you can see if you're at risk with any one of them. And so the way to look at it was what are the big parts of their valuation and then dig into the risks just like you would with any asset. Don't assume everything should be discounted at two or three percent, which the market does. Mm. But that's what they hope for. What they hope for is that just like what Sandstorm did with Hot Modern. So they they wanted a stream on Hot Modern, but the Turks, that company didn't want the stream. So they were forced to like have it as an ownership, which the market doesn't give them the same kind of discount that they give them on a stream. So it was like an equity. It was like, okay, it's a, it's it's an operating asset. You know, we're going to discount you like everybody else. You won't get that 2 to 3% discount rate. You'll get 5 But I don't want the 5 because, look, my theory is that here's the gold and copper price. This thing is such high grade that it's all in sustained costs are so low. Look, it's almost like a stream. So that's what they sold it to the markets. I purchased this. I'm an equity holder of a project, not a stream holder, but it is like a stream. But the market wasn't going to do that. And so what they did was they created another company that basically they moved the asset there and then they streamed out the asset to themselves to get that 200 basis points change in the uh, in, in the valuation of the stream. Because now technically it was a stream. Hmm. So there's a lot of financial finagling you can do. Um uh, that uh, that makes things that are the same look different, uh, mm-hmm. just so you could pick up that premium. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, that, they're very smart people that that do this, but you just got to understand what they're trying to do with that. I know I'm a big old cliche today, but my old buddy Benjamin once told me that uh, the only thing certain in life is death and taxes, and I mean, leave it to the government to steal from you in this case. But how do you deal with that on a more realistic base? I mean, how, how do I deal with that as an investor? Do I look at where the money is coming from in terms of geographical diversification? and But then at the same time, I still have to spend the time to understand their tax code and so on and so forth. So how do you deal with something like that as an investor? Well, I would just look at, you know, if, if, if you know, hindsight being 2020, like if we looked at Franco Nevada, you looked at the big investment into this Panama project, you know, let, let's say it wasn't Panama, let's say it was Zambia or the DRC or whatever, uh, you know, uh, the project looks good, you know, good operator, blah, 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 uh, you know, uh, geopolitically kind of uh, shaky, but hey, I can diversify that in my platform and I will still get a 3% discount rate on something that's in a very shaky jurisdiction. If that was the only asset I had, I'd get probably get killed. Uh, but since it's 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 in a portfolio and people just look at cash flow, uh, you know, uh, you know, people just uh, give me the same discount rate. Uh, the problem is that uh, unless we take these pieces and take them out and discount them at their individual risk profile, we'll get it wrong, and so mm-hmm. we won't value it correctly. Uh, and uh, I used to try to do this uh, when I when I did valuations that, you know, people would say, well, if you don't use the same discount rate, you know, it's not apples to apples. Um, so you got to really measure things uh, like that. And when they do make a big transaction that looks great and it's a win win situation, which Technically, it is because it's a stream off of a base metal operation, which is really what the kind of stream you want. You don't want the kind of streams that are on the main or co-product uh, because you're burdening that main or co-product and burdening your ca- counterparty. You do not burden your counterparty by doing a stream on the byproducts. You're fixing a byproduct credit for them. Mm. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's a financing transaction for them. Uh, it's it's not a, a burden with respect to oh if copper price goes up I'm not realizing most of my copper price because I've got this stream on the copper, which is why I I sort of uh, when I when I play with the equity side I sort of avoid companies that have a stream on the main product or the co product because that sort of 
uh, reading the tea leaves telling me that they couldn't acquire the best type of financing. They went to the lowest rung in terms hmm. of finance, highest cost of capital. So what you're telling me, you like silver royalties then? Uh, I mean, out of the ones I looked at, uh, Wheaton had the best leverage mm. to precious metals and uh, looked the, like a, a better play than, than Be Franco when I did Because of that it. byproduct, because of silver is often a byproduct, right? But they also had a lot of assets in a, diff a lot of different places, and they provide a lot more leverage. Because Franco, you got to understand um, some of their uh, you know diversifications in oil and gas. Uh, so it's great for cash flow. Uh, so, you know, if if people's margins are, are are shrinking because the oil price is going up, Franco is making money, you know, mm -hmm. because they've got royalties on oil and gas. Uh, whereas Wheaton would have more leverage to precious metals if that's what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. No, but because you mentioned that sort of uh, byproduct potential, and I started thinking about what kind of royalties you're looking at then in that case. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a base metal, uh, like a, a lead zinc mine, I mean, perfect for silver, mm. you know, uh, if you're looking for a copper gold project, uh, you know, perfect for gold. Um, if you're looking for a uh, nickel project, good for PGMs, platinum group metals, that sort of stuff. Because if the underlying company, people are investing in the company for their nickel exposure, their copper exposure, you know, uh, uh, whatever, there's zinc exposure and silver, gold, PGMs, what have you as a byproduct, that is not going to burden the company mm. because they'll base their mine plans on the copper, you know, and, and the plant on the copper and everything that comes out comes out as a byproduct with respect to the mine plan for the copper or the lead zinc and that. They're not going to mine for silver hmm. you know it's just coming out because they're doing a lot of tonnage there's five or ten grams in there of silver or there's uh, you know 0. 0.2 grams of gold and it just comes out and so in the end it's such a big you know mine that they produce 100 to 200 thousand ounces of gold they don't care about the gold you know i i used to do this uh, when i worked for phelps dodge uh, we had the candelaria mine in uh, in chile and that was a copper gold mine. We didn't care about the gold. So what I used to do was I bought puts uh, basically on the gold uh, to guarantee our byproduct price on the gold, which was a cost for us, which was a credit. And so we could lock in that that, that amount. Uh, but yeah, we didn't care about the gold. But if streams existed at that point, you know, we would be very interested in doing a stream to lower our financing costs. Well, but you would be interested as a mining company but isn't that uh, a drawback for the stream owner? Because you don't care about the gold. And if you end up not producing, I mean, if it, if, it, if it was a royalty, I'd get it. But because it's a stream, doesn't that change the deal for the, the stream owner? Yeah, well, you'd get the mine plan. You'd look at the mine plan and you go, okay, I could, you know, I'm going to get about 100, 150,000 ounces from this. So mm -hmm. I would back calculate what I'd pay for it. And then I, th the other bonus is that if I worked with a diversified miner, with, with a multi-asset miner, so that if I don't get that 100 ounces from that asset, you're going to give it to me from somewhere else. Mm. You know, And that's what happened with Pascualama. So Pascualama never got built, but Wheaton put the money in. So then Barrick had to go around and getting them silver from other places. You couldn't do that with a single asset developer with a stream on it. That's just not going to happen. That's a very good point because then you, you you not only have to look at the composition of the portfolio of the royalty and streaming company, but you also look at the state of their contracts. What are those contracts specifically for? That's a good point. I like it. Yeah, the other one is if it's a developing project, you know, you're going to get the stream cheaper, uh, but you want it near term production and you want it with a big company that knows what they're doing in terms of building. Hmm. Taking away the geopolitical risk of what happened in Panama, that's actually what happened with First Quantum. They built the project. It was a big project, got built, went commercial. Franco was making you know lots of coin off of it, and it maybe lasted, uh, I don't know, a year. Uh, but the idea was it to last for 20 years and potentially go to 30. You know, uh, that would have been us. Because usually with big companies, what they want is like a steady flat line of revenue 
coming from a specific asset. And they want a bunch of those. And then all this little yeah. stuff coming off of it. Because the problem is the little stuff sometimes takes as much management time as the big stuff. You know, uh, so the more big layers of cash flow you can manifest in your M&A, the better. What you don't want to do is spend a lot of corporate development time and uh, management time buying little things and trying mm -hmm. to cobble them together into something big uh, because you take on a whole bunch of little things. It's easier with a royalty because you don't even have to know the asset. You don't have to know the company because these are little bets. Mm -hmm. They're not big. The streams are big bets, requiring a lot more work in terms of due diligence, especially if it's the development play. Hmm. I'm on a I'm on a quoting wave here, so I I I would quote Rick Roll here too. Is as he says that uh, both big minds and small minds have big risks, but only big minds can make you big money. So what you're telling me here makes sense, and. Um, but what about the, the 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 smaller royalty companies that are just starting out? They have no other choice but to gobble up small things and then work their way towards bigger things. Do you stay away from those, or how do you look at them? No, I mean I'm actually that's a couple of my top picks. One of my top picks that actually did well this year uh, is a royalty generator whose royalty came into money uh, and they were making money, but importantly they kept their GNA and costs manageable, so mm -hmm. the revenue they made they bank that cash. So they don't have to go back to the markets to keep generating new royalties. And that is key. But also they have a royalty, not a big one, uh, but on a potential big project. And so that big project has gone from being a 4 million ounce project to potentially a 10 to 15 million ounce project. My royalty is the same, but the underlying thing has gone, you know, uh, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. So, so the thing is that when you look at a royalty, a royalty does not need to be cash flowing to have value. For me, when a royalty is in a good jurisdiction with a good asset, with the with the company that will actually build it, uh, running the operation, that royalty is saleable now. Because as we know, there's a lot of royalty companies out there but there's not a lot of royalties to be had. And so the, the actual uh, cost of the royalty goes up. So that's why a lot of companies, you know, sell their royalty portfolio that they've, you know, put together over the years. Uh, like at Newmont, we had a royalty portfolio of a whole bunch of things. And, you know, I think they sold it to a company, I think it was Mavericks. Um, SSR Mining sold their royalties to EMX. Uh, and so that's what companies are looking to do because in their in their portfolio, those royalties get zero value and they're not even cash flowing. And here's somebody that says, hey, I'll give you a 50 million for them. Okay, great. Because I mean, the market's not giving me anything for them. It's not going to impact my cash flow. I don't need a shareholder vote for this, but it's $50 million into my treasury. I'll do it, you know, every day, especially when it's overvalued. Like when I value it, I don't get the number you get. You know, because you're saying, oh, you know, I'll, I'll give you four or five percent for it, you know, in terms of a discount rate. But knowing that if they come into cash, I'll get two percent or three percent discount. So I'll, I'll get the 200 basis points gain. You will never get it. But for me as a producer, I'm getting zero for it. Mm. You know, and all I want is the cash. The problem becomes that that the, the amount of companies that actually could take this out of portfolios is limited because they need cash or access to capital because the company that's selling it wants cash. They don't want your shares. Yeah. Because they don't want a you know a bunch of shares in a liquid junior company. What what we'd want is cash. Uh, and so it's only the bigger royalty companies that are able to do these bigger transactions. Mm. It's it's very hard for the little guys to get that leg up. And I don't, I, I don't want to look like a moral warrior here, but it gets me thinking about what that means for the sector as a whole, because, you know, that royalty was just sitting there uh, or all those royalties were sitting there and they weren't requiring extra DNA for the large company. But now you're putting them in small companies and you're increasing the DNA without necessarily increasing the productivity of the sector. So... What does that mean for the sector as a whole? That's something, uh, maybe just a random thought, but uh, 
Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, that that is the thing about valuation because the thing is that, like, we divest. The reason we divest, we don't divest things that, you know, we think are worth this and the market thinks they're worth this. We don't, mm. we don't divest those. We divest the things that the market's not aware of, but we know there's somebody out there that'll pay us five times as much as what we think it's worth. We want, we want it. We want to, you know, liquidate that as fast as possible. I mean, they get it. They put their management time into it and they foster the royalty. Granted, it might not need much, but, they sh but they're taking that value out. I, I don't think it's a bad strategy, uh, personally, uh, to accumulate uh, these kind of royalties uh, because they're sitting there doing nothing. And we, we've seen that with assets as well. So a big company has an asset. They can't do anything with it because it's too small. It just takes management time. Doesn't matter. A company comes in, they're able to raise capital on the market. This is an, an asset we can build. It's got a great margin. It doesn't require a lot of capital. They don't want to do it. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I know I could generate cash flow from this in two years, whereas the big company will never do it ever. Mm -hmm. But it's sitting on the balance sheet as, right. you know, next to zero. I, I think that makes sense. I mean, it, it, with royalties, different. Uh, it's just about the, the valuation differential there, that mm -hmm. you're trying to value something that's getting zero value. I think what else makes sense, though, or is starting to make more sense given the number of royalty players that we have out there is um, consolidation. I'd like to see more M&A in 2024, specifically in the royalty space. We've seen some pretty good deals. Um, Elemental became Elemental Altus. Was it 2020? Yeah. Was it before that? I don't remember. Well, it was it's been a long that. year. No, I'm me. quite familiar with that one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but th that sort of thing is, is great because the royalty... You know, because that's happening with juniors, junior explorers, because, you know, we're wasting money and time exploring and spending money on assets that don't make any sense. And so when when some of these guys who own significant chunks in two companies, they say, hey, you both got assets and you're both in the same jurisdiction. Why don't you join up, cut your GNA and then prioritize those assets and take some of the capital of this company sitting on and allocate it to yours, and then your cost of capital goes down. And so that happened with Adventus and I believe it was Luminex. Both companies are in Ecuador, you know, uh, uh, so anybody that owns them is not surprised about Ecuador. They're already in Ecuador. So th that geopolitical risk issue is not an issue, you know, or um, uh, there was two companies in the Western US, I forget who they were. They also consolidated. I think it was Integra, and um, and somebody else, I can't remember, mm. uh, they consolidated. Again, that's all about conserving working capital, prioritizing where that capital is applied to. Um, and, and that makes absolute sense. And with royalty companies, yes, absolutely. And even more so because there's not a lot of GNA required for a paying royalty. You don't need a whole bunch of people to monitor it. Really, the question about a royalty company is what's your comparative advantage? You know, is it you've got lots of cash flow? Is it you've got access to capital to buy more royalties? Is it that, you know, you read through technical reports and find these third party royalties and buy those, which is which is a good play, because even though the royalty market might be booming, you know, these people that own these royalties may not even know they own the royalties and are just looking for cash. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to get it cheaper from them directly. Um and then the other one is that do you generate royalties? Do you actually go out, you know, state ground and then do joint ventures and earnings and then just walk away with a royalty? Uh, you know, the, the, that's another form of doing it. So everyone uh, has, you know, their different uh, way of doing it. And so if you look at these small royalty companies, you got to see what their comparative advantage is. What is their game plan? Mm. And do you buy it? You know, do they have the right people to do it? Right. But that's exactly what I mean with uh, when I said that I want to see more consolidation in this space specifically, because um, you don't need two teams to run two portfolios of royalties. Like you maybe need 1.2 teams, which means that, you know, if this, if there's two companies and they're each worth, you know, let's say two, when you bring them together, they can be worth five or six or something more than four. Um so that's why I like that consolidation in this space. Interesting what you mentioned about Integra because it's um, 
they had an interesting beginning of the year when they did the merger with um, Millennial Precious Metals. That was it, Millennium Precious Metals. Yeah, yeah I think. And then they got the investment from uh, Wheaton Precious Metals. So they had uh, what it, they did it in in February the merger, and then they got Wheaton in 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 March, I believe, something along those lines. So that was that was also an interesting move. But uh, yeah, I mean, do you, is that something you pay attention to? Like you're looking at two companies, maybe you like them. Uh, maybe you don't like them enough to put your money in, but now that they've now that they've merged, then you can start putting your money in. Is that something you would do? Um, yeah, it depends on the company, like which side I'm on. So mm -hmm. I would prefer that the management team that I supported were the was the management team that kept going with the merged company. So, like, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, like Origin and Renaissance. They got together. Uh, Origin had a cash flowing royalty uh, with uh, with Irma Tanyo that First Majestic operates. Renaissance had the one percent NSR on the Silicon project that wasn't cash flowing. There was no resource on it, but neither wanted to go back to the market and raise capital. Uh, you know, here was the opportunity of having a barbell strategy. You have an underlying prospect generator, which is what both of them did. Um, exposure to uh, low risk jurisdictions, whether it be in British Columbia or uh, Nevada, and at that time, low jurisdiction risk as well in Mexico, uh, less so now. Uh, and then say, okay, do we need all these people? No, uh, we don't. Uh, but, can, but we can still have this comparative advantage of uh, prospect generation, still have the barbell strategy with growth with the 1% NSR and silicon, and a cash flowing royalty, which lowers our cost of capital to you know pay for the project generation and then at the same time they did a a deal uh, a strategic alliance with altius to look for more prospects and royalties in nevada which has worked out fine they've spun out a lot of them uh, uh in at least three uh from 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 nevada doing that so yeah for me that's great and i was and i and i liked that because i like the management from origin and i wanted them to continue because they were more capital market savvy, uh, you know, and uh, but uh, Renaissance had some good people that did prospect generation as well, uh, mm -hmm. and those assets uh, came came to uh, origin as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a good combination. Not all combinations make sense. Let's just say, right? Well, you mentioned the company that you're that you like very much uh, a while ago. Is that is, I mean. Do, Feel comfortable talking names, or is that something you keep free subscribing? I, I, it was just specific because uh, that one I could give you the example, as opposed to sort of trying to get around it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to uh, like uh, push, like, oh, this is the one to buy or anything like mm -hmm. that, but just to give you a, an example and disclose the fact that I actually own it. Right. Okay. Well, this whole thing actually, where where it started, where we got to talk about, I wasn't planning on talking about royalty stocks, but it, it's very welcomed because it's an interesting topic to me. I haven't spoken to anybody about it for a, a long while ago. But um, where it all started was sort of this, this you were describing this top-down framework to approach uh, whatever, whatever's happening in gold and whatever you think is going to happen in gold in 2024. But it, that's not how you've built your own portfolio. Like you, you, you go into your positions from a bottom-up perspective. Like you start at the asset level, and then you move to management, well, and then you end up at the or like how do you do it? Yeah, well, it depends. Like if I'm looking for leverage, and I say, okay, copper is going to go to the moon. Let's say mm. uh, I'm buying a producing company. Mm. I'm putting one of those in because that's the one that's going to give me the most leverage the quickest, um, and then. I will look at other things like if I think that M&A is going to be a big deal, there's not a lot, a lot of assets out there and, uh, you know, fit into the critical market, you know, segregation that's happening with the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and now, you know, foreign operating companies that, you know, you can't get critical minerals from these certain places. Uh, I will look at development plays in, in certain jurisdictions because I think, well, those need to be acquired. Uh, you know, because to to fill this mandate, if this mandate's important, uh, I'll also look at exploration as well in in jurisdictions, mm. uh, because that's your you know uh, your your biggest leverage probably. But it's almost independent of the copper price because their news flow will be driven from discovery. But it's not totally you know uh, different than the copper price in that the copper price sentiment has to be buoyant for them to raise money. 
Hmm. So even though their underlying valuation is a lot of it's determined by their drill results, their ability to go to the market is determined by the the, the actual copper market uh, sentiment. Uh, you know, regardless of what they drill, if they drill great results, but the copper market sentiment is negative, you know, their their ability to raise capital is going to still be uh, difficult. You know, hmm. regardless. Uh, but if the market is buoyant. And they have a, uh, a great project. That's where you really get the win-win, and that's where you make your, you know, triples and five times. That's something I've tried to think about specifically when it comes down to copper, though, because I mean, I, I get it. You know, all these issues that pretty much all the big boys are having from Glencore through Tech, Agnico, Franco Nevada, um, um, First Quantum. I don't mean Franco Nevada. I mean First Quantum with Cobra Panama, whatever it might be. They're all having issues, right? The copper producers. Um, and all of them, all you know, all they're, they're good for the for the copper price. So to put it, uh, I was trying to sound smarter than I really am. That's why I'm stuttering. But so they're not good for the companies themselves, though. They're not good for the companies who own those mines. And yeah. and then yeah. at the same I mean, time, you, yeah. Sorry, I mean, you you do have that issue where you go, oh great, there's you know copper production, there's expropriation. I mean, let's just say in in whatever country X. Mm. Fantastic. That's going to make the copper price go to the moon. Oh, crap. I own a company whose 50% of their assets are in country X. Yeah. So that's problematic. Uh, so you, you want the benefit of the reduction in, in the copper supply, but you don't want to be exposed to the reasons that the copper supply is going down. Uh, you know, so if it's, if it's like, uh, something like Panama, you know, that that's happening. And and then you have a, a development asset in Panama that was sort of doing a closeology play with Cobre Panama saying, oh, look at this big porphyry over here. We've got one over here that we think that they'll have to acquire us. You know, and then it's sort of like, oh, my God, these guys are just shutting down. So now your project's not worth anything. You know, so that's good for the copper price, but not good for that copper equity. You yeah. know, uh, so you've got to be diligent about knowing that, OK, the copper price is going to go up because those deficits that we thought were happening in 2027, 2028 might happen in the latter part of 2024 now because of all the things you talked about. Yeah. Some people are sitting on their hands with respect to some development plays, uh, you know, like El Abra Sulfides or something like that, because you're watching something like Quebrada Blanca, too, and watching their capital, you know, you know, go up 50 plus percent. And they're going, well, is the copper price right now an incentive price for me to take that risk? No, it's not. So all these probable production or possible production that we theorize or forecast, that's going to fill these, the demand uh, that we forecast is not going to be there. It's going to be two years later, three years later. And so suddenly you you always got a baseline production that's going down and then you put these layers of new stuff that's coming in. All this new stuff is problematic, you know, financing risk, development risk, permitting risk, what have you. But then also now the base case is at risk, you know, because now we're talking, you know, expropriation. We're talking about, you know, uh, worries like Cadelco in terms of their production profile going down, the amount of capital they need just to sustain their production, which is part of the base case, you know, how much it costs at Los Bronces and all this other stuff. That's got to raise the copper price. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then the incentive would come for these people to develop. But, but in between that, let's look for an asset that works now, you know, that comes into that window that has all these check marks, good jurisdiction. And also, you know, uh, you know, if we produce concentrate, where is it going to go? Is it arsenic rich? Can we sell it? You know, is the infrastructure there to get it to port? You know, uh, all that sort of stuff is what we have to think about because we're no longer selling a fungible product like gold. We're selling mm -hmm. an intermediate product. Right. Our right. demand isn't, you know, Home Depot or the, the car company, our demand is the smelter. So yeah. what's happening with the smelters? What do the smelters need? Is my concentrate something that they would want? You know, is it the thing everybody needs and suddenly I'll get a premium on my treatment and refining charges that nobody else gets? 
So those are the other things you got to think about. Metallurgy becomes a, a lot more important. Infrastructure becomes a lot more important. But that's not what people are thinking about probably at exploration stage. Yeah. Definitely what they're thinking about at development stage and definitely what they have to deal with when they're producing. This is another very important point to listen to because I hadn't even thought about this before. Like, what do you even sell as a company? Like, what, what's your end? Like, what, what do you sell? I know you 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 try to take copper out of the ground, but what are you selling? What's the end product? Yeah. I hadn't thought about this before 2023. I was interviewing a company early 2023. It was a gold company. And we were talking about it. And so the CEO mentioned Dory bars. And it all of a sudden hit me. It's like, oh, they, they're selling Dory bars. Is that what everybody sells? And it was like, no, that's not the case. Like some companies sell different things. So knowing yeah. what your company sells and who's buying it, very important, very good point. Um, yeah. And that's when you got to look at the flow sheet. You look at the flow sheet, the technical report. Well, they say, you know, they're producing whatever, 250,000 ounces, but maybe 50,000 ounces is fungible. It's Dory. But then another 200,000 ounces is going to a concentrate. And let's say that's a sulfide concentrate, what they call a sulfide or a pyrite con. And then you go, well, who's going to want that? Does that got arsenic in it? You know, so if, if it suddenly got deleterious elements in it, then the amount of smelters that will take it goes down. And suddenly they've got you where they want you in terms of payability. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with a lot of these sulfide concentrates is the payability. You're not going to get the payability that you get with a dory. You know, you might be getting 90% or less, depending on the quality of that concentrate. Because really, a lot of these smelters want the sulfur in that concentrate. They care less about the gold because uh, they just need the sulfur to run the smelter. Uh, and so you want to give them a good sulf uh, sulfur product. Mm. Sometimes you want to give them flux, like silica. And they don't care about the gold, but they want the flux and they want the silica. And that happens a lot in Japan. Uh, mm. There's a lot of smelters there. They look for silica flux. You might have an epithermal gold deposit, but really the the only way you can sell it because you can't permit uh, a cyanide in Japan is to sell it to a smelter. But now, even though you've got really good grade, you might have to worry about, oh, I got to give them more silica, but that's the low grade stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, but that's the only way I can sell it. Yeah. yeah. So that's the sort of stuff you got to think about because it's not. Uh, just, oh, I produced 200,000 ounces. Okay, 200,000 ounces times $2,000 per gold price. It doesn't work like that. Mm. Uh, you know, it's the easiest thing is when you have 200,000 ounces of fungible dory, but not all companies or assets produce that, as you point out. Yeah. And that's something why why I brought it up is because I'm um I like to believe that I'm not the the least uh, or not, not not the stupidest person out there. So uh, I'm sure that there's people who maybe are in the same situation thinking about uh, not thinking about these things that they should be thinking about. So another good point. Well, take, yeah. Take um you know I'm not I'm stepping on any toes here, but if you take uh, generation mining, a company we used to hold in the portfolio, you know palladium and copper are their co-products. And then they, mm. they did a stream on, I believe, some of their gold and platinum or something, or in silver with Wheaton, and then which, which brought the money in, which is perfect win-win situation for both. But in the end, what they're producing is a concentrate. So their concentrate is a copper con. So that copper con has to go to a copper smelter. And so what they have to think about, even though palladium might be 40 to 50% of the revenue, uh, uh, depending on the palladium and the copper price, the product is a copper concentrate. So the quality of the product is what gets sold. So it's within that that you got the palladium, but you have to dress it up into a, a viable copper con that a smelter would want. That's the product. And then what I make out of it, it depends on how good that product is. And then I have to negotiate the payabilities not just on the copper, but also importantly on the palladium, because that's an important part of my revenue stream. Right. Um, so those are all those negotiations that don't get really determined until you have a feasibility study and you're in permitting stage. Mm -hmm. But that's the sort of stuff you need to know. And that's another reason when people start going on about, um, you know, gold equivalents copper equivalents or zinc equivalent, you know, whatever. They'll throw all these other things in and institute revenue uh, with no metallurgy. 
with no payability, with no nothing. So you're assuming that you're going to get 100% of the gold, 100% of the silver, 100% of this, 100% of that, which is really not the case. Hmm. Uh, and, and so that's another thing you got to think about when you go, oh, look at the grade of that. Look, on a gold equivalent basis, that's like 20 grams. Well, really? Like, what does that actually look like? How much of it is this? And how much of it is that? And how much really silver is there? Hmm. You know, in that silver equivalence. A lot of the companies still have the other issues, though, like labor issues. They have uh, cost blowouts and stuff like that. So there's, I mean, I, I don't even know if there's like a clean copper producer that's not had any of those issues over the last two years. So how do you even approach building a portfolio in that case? Well, in terms of copper, um, you know, I check out infrastructure because one of the big issues around the world, and especially in a lot of the copper producing countries all the way from Chile to the U.S., uh, is water. So water constraint is huge. So, you know, back even in the 90s when I worked in South America, you know, it was the adage was, I'll quote, do a quote, uh, but I don't know who said it, but it, it was like you drill a good copper intersection, your next hole is for water because you got to make sure you've got some. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now that's you take that to the nth degree. And it's not just water. It's non-potable water because most projects can't compete for potable water. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you have to have water. You have to have you know, power. You have to have roads. You have to have port. You have to have all this other stuff. Um, that's a big deal. The labor thing that you're talking about is a global issue. It's not specific to any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. The water, the power, the port, uh, that is an issue uh, that, that can be a jurisdictional specific. I'll take labor to a different level in that labor risks can be an issue in some of these third world countries where there are not a lot of universities that produce engineers. Because I remember when Nevson was running Bisha and they were weighing, you know, different ways of actually mining it. And one way was this big uh, pre-strip and layback versus another way of making the mine life smaller and less mine life. And one of the big problems with that was the labor because to get people in from outside there were restrictions on who they could bring and how many people they could bring such that it just was not feasible uh to get that kind of labor in to operate the trucks and things like that that they would need to do that pre-strip so even though you know if that pre-strip was let's say in arizona or nevada you could do it it might cost you more uh but you could do it but there it actually wasn't technically feasible to do it because because of the constraints in terms of getting these people in uh, and actually mining it the way you think. So like you said, there's practice, there's theory, and there's practice actually doing it. And that's where you dig into it, and then you find out, well, actually, we can't do that. Mm. And then you just sort of kick that option, and that's, just, that's, that's not even an option anymore. Mm. Um, in, when you're thinking about it, as an investor, you go, well, that should be easy, and it's just going to be a high strip, so it'll be high cost, ball, but it's just not even possible. And that can be an issue with some of these uh, with some of these jurisdictions that are that are third world. You just cannot get the people. But if you put all of these things into a framework and you start, you know, crossing off names off your list, like that's not good enough because jurisdiction, that's not good enough because of financing, that's not good enough because of labor. There's not much left. Uh, in terms, of, are there any left? Is really the question. Well, I mean, the thing is that you know we know, like Barrick is building a multi-billion-dollar copper project in Pakistan. Hmm. Is Pakistan my number one jurisdiction? No. Am I looking for other projects in Pakistan? No. But it says to me that some companies are willing to go to these shakier jurisdictions so they don't have to overpay for an asset. So when they look and say, well, do I really want to pay 50% more than I think a company is worth and then have to pay that extra 50% more again because the capital is going to blow out? No, I don't want to do that. I want to get something at a 50% or lower discount knowing that I've got a lot of wiggle room when the capital goes up. I'm not going to overpay for this asset. I will take on the geopolitical risk 
so I don't overpay. Somebody else will say, I will overpay so I don't have this geopolitical risk that this that, uh, this asset might be taken away from me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the way you got to think about it when you're investing is what risk are you willing to take on? And remember, we're in the equity. We don't have to be in it for 30 years. Mm-hmm. We can come in and leave. You know, that's, that's, that's the bonus. Uh, but it's also we don't have all the information either uh, in terms of what's going on there. So we're not the debt holders. We're not the royalty holders. We're not the streamers. We don't get the tours. We don't get, oh, here's the mine plan. There's the mine plan here. That's the feasibility study. It was five years ago. Or here's our mine plan. Okay. Mm-hmm. You come into the back room, you 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 got the non-disclosure agreement, you know, whatever. We don't get that all that information. We'll just get quarter on quarter and guidance. Uh, and then we'll always go back to the feasibility and study and say, look, oh, this doesn't jive. You said this and now it says how does not only is that different than this year, how does that impact the next three to five years? That's really what I need to know as as an analyst or an investor. That's information you won't get, you know, but these other people will. Um, so there is, you know, uh, a difference in uh, in information asymmetry there uh, that uh, that we have to deal with as as an equity investor. Right, but then that makes me think. I mean, it's it's almost like a case for the royalties because if you trust the royalty management enough, they had that access for you, so you trust them to make a good deal on your yeah. behalf as an investor. Yeah, which I don't. <laughs> Uh, the worst thing that you could do is assume that people are doing the right thing. It, it's like watching movies. Like you might trust an actor that says this guy or lady knows what she's doing and she always picks the best directors and she reads the scripts and they're always great movies. So I'm not even going to look at the title of that movie. If she's in it, I'm watching it because she's really good. And for me, you know, Michael Caine was one of those people. I mean, he did a lot of shaky movies, but usually the movies he was in were pretty good. And so do you have a person like that, that you trust enough, that no matter what they do, even if you're sort of like, oh, really, is that really going to work? That they know what they're doing. That's why we always go back to management, that you have this underlying trust. And so we have companies, I have companies in the portfolio that I've held for five, seven years almost a decade in some. Why? Because I trust management. I don't have to think twice about how they're going to act. You know, uh, I know they're going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you find that management, you're very willing to ride that thing up and down. So when they have a really good year, you'll probably sell some. When they're back down, same management team trying to do the same, you'll buy more. That's really... What, what the company I look for in the portfolio. I don't, like, I might have a trading play that I see a moment that, oh, this might happen. So here's a punt. It's three three months. Let's see what happens. But I think this gets taken out because of blah, blah, blah. Or this, this permitting issue is not really an issue. This will get resolved in three months. But this is a short-term play. Done. Then I'm out. That doesn't happen very often in the portfolio. Most of the portfolio is about trying to pick people that I can stick with for a long time. The my you know one of my major investment thesis is that I don't get embarrassed because it's not only their reputation; it's my reputation. Because I'm not just buying for myself; is I'm telling everybody I'm buying. I'm not telling them to buy, but they might come in because I am. So they're considering my own due diligence. Mm. So do I follow you down this path? You know, because I think you know what you're talking about. And so when I take that responsibility, then I have to be more diligent with the people I get myself involved with. Mm. Uh, and, And when you take that sort of burden on, you get even more introspective, more like, no, I'm not going to touch that because I know this guy. And then in six months, I know I'm going to get screwed. And then I'll go back to them and say, oh, did you know that was going to happen? I said, well, yeah, I knew because this guy is like that. No, I can't even make that investment, even though it might double in three months. I don't care. That's not something I'll go. That's not a path I'm willing to walk down. The fact that you care 
so much about management. Well, that explains to me why you only have one uranium stock in your portfolio. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, or or silver. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not about you know pumping it all into uh, and and the, the the uranium name has been there for like four or five years on and off. Uh, because the thesis is the same, but I was waiting for that overlying inventory that was invisible to go away. Uh, otherwise, it was just no play. Uh, it, and also, it, 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 it's, it, for me, it tells me a lot when Cameco's major acquisition was for downstream in Europe. For them thinking that was where the value was, as opposed to buying some development assets in the Athabasca uh, Basin. You know, that's where I said, no, why aren't you buying development place for growth? Why are you going downstream? You know, well, they're thinking that, okay, if the Russians are out, we can fill that gap. And then we supply them directly with our own stuff. We don't have to worry about an incident like Japan where, you know, we have a, an accident and then suddenly they're not taking our stuff anymore and the, the contracts aren't there. We, we're actually buying our own stuff. And then we're going to go all the way downstream and then we're going to fill this market um, you know, and, and we'll be the will be the players. So uh, it, it, those, those sort of market dynamics mean a lot to me, you know, and how people play it, how people recognize what's changing and how to react to it. And so you pick those kind of management teams that can react, know what they're doing and the information they get, they act on it. You know, there's one thing is data and another thing is information. And then the other thing is how you act with it. You know, because there's a lot of data out there, but how much of it is signal and how much of it's noise? And those, and even when you get that signal, are you still lying on your ass, not doing anything about it? Mm. So yeah. that's where management comes in. That's really where the comparative advantage is. So they might have a crappy asset right now, you know, but eventually they might have a good asset, but you know that when they have it, they're going to do the right thing with it. You know? yeah. But that is that equally important in every step of the way of the Lausanne curve? Like, do you care as much about this when you look at the juniors as you do when you look at the producers? A different kind of management scheme. Okay, so if I'm looking at a junior explorer, I definitely want people that know what they're doing in terms of exploration, whatever it is, that they know about these kinds of deposits, they know about this kind of jurisdiction, they can speak the language, they are good at ESG locally, all that sort of stuff has to work. And you know, they're telling me stuff I don't know. Hmm. The problem is, is when I go on site and I'm telling them things that they don't know. You know, yeah. that scares me. I don't want to be a consultant on my site visit. Hmm. You know, I want, you know, I, I end up being that sometimes because I do have some experience, but I don't want to be telling them everything. Hmm. If they keep asking me questions, then I get more worried. Hmm. Um, no, I, I, I do understand what, you, what you're saying there. And it's, um, yeah, different skill set and so on and so forth. Um, within that framework, to go back to what you told me about gold, would you approach copper the same way as you would approach gold with sort of the same framework? Yes, but now I need to know even more things. And not only do I need to know how to mine it, which is generic, uh, 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 but I need to know more about metallurgy. Okay. And I need to more know more about product. Because again, I'm, I'm not selling a fungible product. Uh, so is this going to be a good enough grade? Where is the smelters it can go to? What's the freight look like? Uh, where's the nearest port? Uh, all that sort of stuff I need to know. I didn't need to know that for gold. I didn't need that management team to know that. Like I didn't need a management team that's selling 100% Dory to know what the port facilities are near their project. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, but with the copper project, I need to know infrastructure. You know, uh, does, you know, because I don't want isolated projects because that's going to take 20 years uh, to get in. Be and, and they're sitting on their hands waiting for government to build the road. You know, Whereas, let's say, in some parts of Africa, the Chinese come and build the road for their own copper. So I'll, I'll build the copper mine, and then I'll take the copper. I'll build the road so I can take the copper on my, my copper, my road, my port. That's exactly what's happening in Africa. 
It happened in Africa for the last two to three decades with the Chinese. Now, the U.S., the Europeans, and I think Trafalgura as well, are building a railway to the Central African Copper Belt to get the copper to come out to the West, to Angola, because they don't want to use the Chinese infrastructure. So that's another thing that's big that's happening, because we're finding that there's just not enough infrastructure. That's a big problem in Peru, even though Peru is a big copper producer, second, well, now it's sort of battling the DRC for being second. Infrastructure is a big deal because once a group cuts off one road, you're done. There's no other road that's going to the port. You know, uh, that stops copper. It doesn't stop me from mining it, but all the concentrates just sitting there at the mine. It's not getting to the port, you know, um, and, and so that's another issue. So mining is difficult, obviously, but when you dig into it, that sort of stuff, water, infrastructure, um, you know, ESG, social license, uh, all that becomes a big deal uh, in terms of, okay, I'm in it. Uh, how long is it going to last? Is it going to get bought out? Uh, do, they, uh, you know, do they have any problems with water? Are people going to complain that they're using too much water? Uh, you know, and I've, I found Brazil to be like very good with respect to, uh, like I went to a project down there a couple of years ago and I was asking them about the plant, they're making all these modifications. And I said, you know, I, I worry about water and power constraints because they have no power constraints or water. That, that, that pipe that they have to the dam that's huge is theirs. And they're actually providing water to the locals there. That's their water, that's their pipe. And otherwise, you know, the power there is from the same dam, so it's all hydro. And so, you know, they're basically green power and whatever, seven to eight cents kilowatt hour. There's no constraint. Mm. You know, compare that with another project that might be in the middle of nowhere and you need diesel. You know, great. The grade is 1%, 2% open pit. But Jesus, you know, you need diesel. You need to freight that diesel up. You're going to use diesel for your trucks. You're going to use diesel for your power plant. Oh, the ore is hard. So, oh, I'm going to need a semi autogenous uh, grinding mill. Okay, great. That's going to be another thing. You know, th that sort of stuff becomes more important the more remote a project is. More remote projects usually have more risk of capital escalation as well during development. Mm. You, you brought up the, the Chinese in Africa. That's an interesting point that I want to go in. G this sort of this popular belief out there, I believe that the Chinese are done in Africa, like they had their time in Africa, but now they're going to be moved out. But at the same time, I look at the Belt and Road Initiative and how much money the Chinese are investing within that Belt and Road Initiative in Africa specifically. And I'm thinking there's no way they're going to be out. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of split in that. What's your take? Uh, whoever said that's full of, uh, you know what, there's no way the Chinese are leaving Africa. See, uh, yeah. They're... There are specific places uh, that they might have to leave, but they're, they're in most places. I mean, the DRC is getting close to becoming the second biggest copper producer because of the Chinese. I mean, yeah. obviously because of Ivanhoe and Robert Freeland, but because they put in the money when First Quantum was leaving the DRC, Phelps Dodge was leaving the DRC, everyone was leaving the DRC. They came in, built the infrastructure, and they got that copper out. Uh, you know, they are still in Zambia. They're investing in lithium projects. They've been investing in uranium projects forever uh, in, in countries that a lot of Western companies won't touch. Uh, you know, there's 50 countries in Africa. You know, <laughs> so anybody that says, oh, I'm out of Africa, it's a good book. But yeah, that's not the reality here. I agree. That's uh that's basically what I'm getting from the other people people that have asked that question. And why I'm even asking that in the first place, because I have, um, I think my biggest position in my personal portfolio is in West Africa. Uh, shockingly too many, it's not a uranium stock. Um, but um, no, it's uh, it's an interesting, also because I've, I've been paying attention to what's happening at the uh, um, in, in the Arabian Nubian Shield. Yeah, uh, because of its geological potential, there's one specific company that I have my eye on that it's just being stuck. There's been no news. I, I don't have shares of them, but uh, there's been no news in the last year. Share price is kind of stuck. It's going nowhere. And um, I mean, everything out there stays on, stays on a, an arguably 
well-deserved discount, so to put it, because of whatever's happening. And now you have right. the Red Sea issues on top of that as well. So what's your, is, are you paying attention to the to that shield? Well, yeah, I, I was in there earlier this year. I was in, e in Egypt um, about 10 years ago. I'd, I'd been to Eritrea, and, and mm -hmm. potentially this year I'm going to get to Saudi. Um, the, the, the issue with that, I mean, the, the underlying thematic in that area is not only the prospectivity, but the money to act, because there's almost like an infinite supply of capital, low-cost capital coming from the Middle East to develop this battery thing that they want to do like a lot of people talk about battery infrastructure a lot of people talk about you know we want all this downstream we want to create this battery hub they actually have the money to do it you know right. uh, so uh capital's not an issue there uh, the problem is all the conflict you know uh sudan in a war uh, that nobody talks about, um, you know, Ethiopia on and off, um, and then Eritrea on and off, um, Egypt. And the, the more south you get, the more Wild West it is. Uh, as the Sudanese miners come up, conflict with the the, the Bedouin, uh, and you get lots of uh, issues there. And then you get the army as well, who actually own a lot of the claims in the southern blocks. Uh, I know a lot of people have been moving to Saudi because uh, you know they want they want uh, you know to to invest in their own mining projects. So you follow the capital and the smart guys. You know they they went from the Chinese like like Barrick and Bristow. Uh, you know had uh, Zijin mining, I believe, with Barrick uh, for a while, and then and then Ivanhoe uh, with with uh, with the Chinese and the DRC, and now. He sees that the next big source of money is Saudi, and so he's now working in Saudi Arabia with uh, with the Modern Group, uh, you know, because that's where the capital is. So if if the Western markets aren't generating the capital for for these projects, there's no end to capital coming from there, and those guys will be very uh, first close to where they are, which is the Arabian Nubian Shield, but also they'll venture to other places in Africa where their competition will be the Chinese and potentially now uh, some U.S. Uh, companies as well as the U.S. is now uh, getting back into Africa. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for them to get that goodwill, not goodwill, but I mean that, because the Chinese have been doing it for like almost 20 or 30 years. The U.S. has not been putting that kind of money into, uh, into Africa. Mm -hmm. But they, what they realize is for them to permit their own minds takes infinity and their ability to, uh, you know, to, uh, to permit and build processing facilities, which is really some of the big deal that they want to fund, is very difficult. So what, they would, what they're pushing out is some of that to other countries, whether it's building a smelter in Chile, building these railways in Africa, all that sort of stuff. And then making these little side agreements because it's really, they talk about free trade agreements. Um, you know, that's how you get into the uh, IRA uh, subsidy. Uh, but if they make these side agreements, then people are all sort of negotiating to try and get the subsidy. And that's what they're trying to offer these people. Mm. But most of these countries, uh, South America, Africa, that will play both ways. They don't really care. So if the Americans want to make a deal with them, great. If the Chinese come up with a bigger deal, they'll go with the Chinese. That's the same in Chile and it's the same in Brazil. Mm. The new guy in Argentina, I, I, I guess he's against the Chinese. So he's more willing to, uh, to have U.S. partners. Mm. Uh, but the lithium sector, a lot of the lithium sector in northwest Argentina is being built by, has been built by, by uh, Gang Feng, uh, which is obviously a Chinese company. Mm. I want to talk about Millie um, a little bit, maybe further in a couple yeah. of minutes, because what I'm because because you're right there close to him, potentially in his house. Uh, rumor has it, who knows? But um, no, I want to talk about the the. I, I was just wondering all all that you're explaining here to me about the whatever's happening in on um in East Africa on the uh, Arabian Nubian Shield. Is the geological potential really worth all, all the headache and, and everything that's happening there and the risk, really? Let's not call it headache, but the risk. Well, is it worth it for you? Uh, it might be. Yeah, it, it's not uh, it, It's not 
perspective. There, there, there's potential because it's underexplored, and that's what's fascinating about it. Um, and and so you can go to outcropping gold mineralization. You don't need to go undercover like you do in most countries now. Uh, you know, we've been doing undercover um, drilling uh, in in Australia since my time in the early '90s. Now, undercover is the thing that's happening in Chile. It's been happening in other places. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the case in the Arabian Nubian Shield. I mean, you can still go to outcropping deposits there or, or potential deposits yeah. there. Uh, and so that's what fascinates people. Access is an issue, uh, you know, uh, even in Egypt. You know, uh, it's just different, you know, the way you have to operate in some of these places. You just got to understand the local sort of dynamics. Uh, in Saudi, is if you've got a Saudi partner, not unlike how it was in Turkey, you just need a local partner. Once you have a local partner, everything becomes a lot easier. And so there's no way you would go into Saudi and be 100% you and think you could do everything like, let's say, in British Columbia or in Arizona. That, mm -hmm. that you would you would definitely need a local partner. Yeah. That never stopped uh, Adolf Landin. May he rest in peace. So. Oh, but I mean, he was in Argentina where you didn't really need a local partner. Uh, he was in the DRC. No, I mean, uh, his first days when he first started off with oil and he was in the... Uh, yeah, you know, oil, oil is a bit of a different thing because obviously he had the, the Americans and everything because they were bringing everything in terms of capital as well as know-how. Mm. Uh, and so the, the, what they're doing in mining has some parallels with oil and gas because now we're seeing a lot of expats go again to Saudi, but now for mining. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when I went to the Colorado School of Mines, uh, you know, uh, most of the Middle Eastern people that were coming to the school that were studying mineral economics in my class were all for oil. None of them. Well, there was only one guy, I think, from Oman that was in minerals. Everybody Not surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... Now we'll see most of those guys, you know, uh, coming to study mining as well, uh, because mm. this this would be, uh, this this would be, you know, eventually they get all the expats in, but then eventually they want their own people to do it. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Well, what else? So infrastructure in um, in Eastern Africa and just generally in Africa as a whole, you're looking for water, you're looking for infrastructure. What else are you looking for? Well, I mean, those are the big ticket items. You know, uh, you're really looking for people that, I mean, let's say if, we, if I'm looking for a development play, I'm looking for people that have experience developing a similar scale project in a similar jurisdiction. Yeah. That's that's a big deal. You don't want to pay for something to learn on the job. Uh, that can be very costly. So you do want, and then you look at the board as well to see if they add any value. Do they know anything about this? Like, I don't want a whole bunch of accountants on the board. It's nice to have one to know that you can get audited. But I want somebody who's built a project before. I want somebody who lives in the country that they're operating to know if they've got governmental relations, uh, somebody who knows about ESG. All the risks that the company has, one of those risks or a few of those risks have to be mitigated by the knowledge of either the management team, the board, or technical advisors. There's got to be some in-house knowledge, you know, uh, about that. I, you know, when I went there, I, I want to learn from them to see what are they doing, how are they reacting, you know, what they feel are the big risks to to doing uh, to meeting their goals. So everyone's got an objective. My issue is that what's constraining that objective? What are the risks to getting to that objective? What do we have to know? What are the gaps? You know, what don't we know? It's not only drilling gap. It's I got to find water. Okay, what are you doing to do that? I got to I got to get this power grid relationship. Okay, what are you doing? Is that's a catalyst I need to know, even though it's not on your deck. That's something I need to see what the progress in that is because I might think that that's a big deal, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that sort of stuff, you know. And, and it's and for me, I really get a lot of that out of the site visits because you can read a technical report, you can see their deck, but most of the deck is an advertisement. It's like here, it's all the good things that are going to happen. It's not a detail. There's a disclosure statement, but there's not a lot of detail on the risks. Because when they're not asked, okay, what is the gap between this 
and you actually getting to where you want to get to, which I might be in agreement to. Like if the goal is something I'm not interested in, there's no point in owning that company. But if the goal is something that I think, oh, that could work. But where are you with respect to that goal? Do you have social license? You know, have you drilled the thing out to know that that's actually a resource? You know, um, you know. Do you understand? If, is the port is the port facility a deep water facility, or does somebody have to dredge it out to you know make it accessible for for you to get a uh, you know a ship in there to take your copper con or something like that? Mm-hmm. Those are the sort of things that you think about. Like like for example, for example. So I was down in Chile, and um, you know water is obviously a big issue, and so now. These companies are doing desalinization plants. Somebody else is doing the desalinization plants. Desalinization also requires a lot of power. And so um, if a company has to build its own desalinization plant, they're exposed to power and also salt water. And then they have to, uh, you know, uh, bring that fresh water up to uh, pipe it up. The problem is that some people are actually looking at salt water, just taking salt water directly into their plant. You know, that will have issues, you know, with corrosion and stuff like that in their asset. But metallurgically, some people are finding that their actual recoveries are better. And so here's an opportunity that I don't need a desal plant. I could take direct seawater. And a few few companies are operating like this in Chile. But the problem is that those pipes that are carrying the seawater for somebody who's got a farm, that's like a pipe of poison that's going through their fields. And so that's a big risk. And so you got to really know where that pipe is going and whether, you know, you can actually do it. Some places you can, some places you can't. Uh, you know, so that's some other things you got to think about uh, when, when, when you look at, uh, you know, water access and things like that. But that's not something I would know off the bat unless I actually went down there, drove through a farmer's field and then said, OK, where's this pipe going? And the guy said, no, we can't put it through here because they don't want it. Mm-hmm. So we have to have a desal plant. There's no way around it. Um, or or tailings, tailings is that footprint's huge. And if you're dealing with a hundred thousand ton per day operation, you have to do dry stack tailings. Dry stack tailings for a project of that size has never been done, and so that's another big risk. If it's never been done before, and the one that you're, you know, investing in is going to be the first to do it, that's a big worry. Mm. Mm even on M&A, because there's nobody out there that brings a comparative advantage and says, oh, I can do that. Nobody's done it. Mm-hmm. So your potential for M&A goes to zero. I'd normally push back here on on saying, you know, site visits is, is what is going to, uh, you know, give you that uh, edge because it's not really applicable for most of us. But I suppose that's where your sales pitch comes in for Exploration Insights is that you go do the site visits and you're right about but that. You don't, sometimes you don't need site visits if it's a big company and there's a lot of disclosure. Mm. But the smaller the company, the less the disclosure, the site visits more crucial. Mm. You, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Like and I, if I, a, tech, I wouldn't have to go out and see all their assets. Mm. That would be logistically improbable. Yeah. You also made a good point that the presentation is marketing material. Um, incredibly important point. Also something else that I only realized in 2023 by going to conferences and talking to these people is that everything that they do online, besides the official filings that they file with the government on uh, that's setterplus.ca right now is what they changed the name to. Everything that they file or everything that they publish outside of that is marketing material. All the what all of it. So the website, the presentation, fact sheet, whatever they do on social media, all the interviews, whatever it might be, they're there to sell you the the thing that they generate revenue with. Is they're shares. there to sell you the dream. And yeah. so when I look at a presentation, I don't look at what they're telling me. I'm looking at what they're not telling me. Hmm. So they're talking about size and tonnage and volume. Then I know grades a problem. And if they're talking about grade, then usually tonnage is an issue. Uh, if they don't mention one thing, that's the thing I'll ask them about. Uh, because there's always this way of trying to not talk about, you know, the issue, you know. Uh, and then sometimes when you talk to them, they'll bring it up. They go, oh, thank you, because that's not something I thought about, but thank you for telling me. Oh, metallurgy is an issue, because I didn't see it here. 
well, it is an issue. And he goes, because uh, that's the history of this project. Okay, so what is the problem? Blah, 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 blah. Mm. Uh, but that might not come out in their presentation. Nobody may ask. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, And when you start digging, then you start realizing, ooh, that is a problem. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why nobody's touched this project. Um, and it's really digging it when you, and then when site visits, it's not just the site you're seeing that's important, is the sites you don't see sometimes. When you go to that site visit, you start asking them about the project down the road. You know, and mm -hmm. when you, when I take a, a meeting with some company, I might not be interested in that specific company. The only reason I'm talking to them is because I'm interested in a company nearby. And this guy has no issues telling me everything. So he'll say, oh, but you know, they've got an issue with blah, blah. I go, no, I didn't. They never told me. He goes, yeah, that's one thing, you know, that that is an issue. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. So there was this company in, in, in Ireland. So I went on a site visit. And prior to going on a site visit, I looked at another company nearby. And then I said, well, I guess you got a cyanide permit, uh, you know, so it must be possible. So there's no reason they couldn't get one. And he goes, well, yeah, I got it, but I'll never use it because if I did use it, I'd get run out of town. So I thought, ah, that's interesting. And so whenever I modeled that company's production, I always modeled it as them producing a concentrate and shipping it to Newfoundland or somewhere to get smelted because I didn't think that they would actually be able to use Sinai. I mean, that project went private because permitting became a nightmare. And one of the big issues with permitting was the Sinai. It wasn't the mining part. It was the processing part. Hmm. And there was not a lot of protest about it because people just took it for granted that it would never happen. When was that? Was that in 2023? Uh, no, this was several years ago. This was like 2016, 2017. Oh, okay. What's, uh, what's the wildest thing you saw in 2023 on a side visit? Oh, snakes. Uh, that was one thing. Uh, snakes as in junior mining CEOs or just actual? No, real snakes that actually kill you, that sort of thing. Uh, that was interesting. I mean, I, I like in Egypt, you know, when, when you get all... Um, you know, oh, everything's happening in Egypt. Look at all the bidding going on, blah, 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 blah. And then when you actually get, you know, boots on the ground, oh, we can't take you to that project because there's been an incident. Mm. And we start, you know, what is that incident? Oh, you know, they, some people got killed. We, why? You know, that, uh, and that sort of, sort of thing, well, the more south you get, the more problematic you get. You need little passes to go into the desert. You need a desert pass. Like a tourist can't just go into the desert. I couldn't just pick up a rental car and go in the desert. There is a part in the northern desert I could. When I want to go from the Red Sea to the Nile in the north, I could do it. Further south, all those roads, you can't go unless you have a desert pass. And that's given by the military. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will stop you from going in. You, know, uh, you can't cross the desert. So uh, you don't realize that until you actually go there. You know, right. you're just looking, oh, hey, barracks in there. Look at these guys. Look at look at what's happening. Oh, this must be great. You know, and then you get there, oh, it's not so great. Hmm. You know, and it's just sort of like nuances about that sort of stuff that, that you, I really pick up on, on a site visit, you know, just logistics about doing anything. You find out, oh, hey, you know, well, we couldn't get the rig in. Well, what's the problem with the rig in? I'm not saying there's a problem in Egypt, but in some other places. There's nobody here that knows how to drill, so we got to bring in expats. Oh, but they're having a problem with their visas. Okay. Oh, and there's no drill rigs here, so we have to make our own. Oh, because we're importing them now. That's taken six months. That's why the drilling has been slower. That sort of stuff, you, you, you don't know. You, you just assume, oh, here's a country, first world. You know, what can be, the, what, what problems are there? They've got lots of infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. But you know, they just don't do what you do. So they don't have any of that kind of infrastructure in terms of drillers, in terms of, you know, people who know how to drill, in terms of a drilling company, in terms of, you know, people who know how to sample, you know, an assay lab, that sort of stuff. It just doesn't exist because we don't do that. Uh, you know, so th that's, you only find that out sometimes when you go there and then you find out, okay, that's why this is happening like this. That's why you do this. Uh, like some people look at a drill, plan and then they see 
this one drill platform drilling everywhere. And you go, Jesus, what the hell are they doing? And then you actually go to site and you go, oh my God, you know, this is really right on top of in the edge of a cliff. And this is the only place that they could actually put the pad. Now, or, you know, that's the only place that they were permitted to disturb. And they, you know, their other permit is longer term and that's going to take two years. And so they'll drill what they can on the limited amount of disturbance that they can do. Those are the sort of things you can see. Uh, like I was at this project in Mongolia a long time ago and, you know, they came out with some really nice results. And they put out this long section, looked really interesting. But then, you know, when I was there and looking at it, it goes, Jesus, there's like a whole bunch of holes here. Why don't I see that in the long section? So then I asked for all the data and then we plotted it, you know, with a 25 meter, you know, window on either side. And Jesus, there were like a million holes there that weren't in the diagram that they were giving, not because they were trying to hide it, but they were just trying to highlight the good ones. But then you could see where all the other holes were that didn't have anything. And then, then you kind of question continuity. You question how big is this because you've already got a hole here and it's got nothing. But I wasn't able to see that in your other section. Mm. But now it is. Uh, so those are the sort of things that, you know, are, are good to look at because, uh, you know, like we were talking about, the presentations uh, present an idealized version of their, of their concept. Mm. You know, and then yeah. you have to because uh, they'll only always tell you the good stuff. Uh, you'll have to dig in a lot of management, te- not a lot, the management teams that really are into the project and want to build it. They need to know what the risks are. They're not trying to hide from the risk. They want to make sure that you know that they're trying to mitigate them. That's what I'm here for. Yes, this is a risk. That's why I got this guy, this guy. That's what we're working on. Boom. Mm. You know, and then the risk you take is their ability to do it, not their ignorance of the risk, not the fact that they're trying to hide the risk. They're meeting the risk full on. Now you're mitigating, the, you're, you're betting on their ability to mitigate the risk. You know, that's where management comes in. Yeah. That's, um, I, whenever I interview management teams and, or CEOs or whatever, those can be long discussions. Like I, I'd sit down with them for like an hour and a half. And then someone would say, why do you think someone is going to watch this, you know, video on a small five or 15 or $20 million junior that's an hour and a half. And that's when I realized that a lot of people just put less than an hour and a half of research into these things. And this conversation that we're having here, you and I, Joe, is is just reminding me that I'm probably not doing enough research on my picks. So, Well, I mean, the thing is that sometimes you just get a private placement. Oh, this looks cheap. This looks good. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. And then you just do it without even thinking. I've done that. And mm-hmm. then you look, oh, my God, do I own this? That's what happens sometimes. You go, oh, you know what? I just found out I own this, you know, and, and boom. You know, they either went up or they went down. Something crashed and I had some of it. But I can tell you when I do it in the letter, because of the burden of proof, understandable, uh, reputational risk, uh, you know, and, 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 and the responsibility to the subscribers, that's just something I... That, that that I won't bring into the letter. I might invest in myself, but I'll never put it in the letter because I haven't done enough due diligence or there's another risk that I don't think people want to take on. You know, mm. that I want to say, oh, here's, here's a great one, but, ooh, God, this is a big risk. But, I mean, I don't think you should take this risk on. You know, I don't want to expose you to this one because yeah. it just, even if it goes up five times, I'm not going to gloat about it because it was a big, you know, problem. Mm. You know, I didn't know management that well or or something else, or they weren't going to get those assets that they thought they were going to get. So, uh, yeah, uh, so that's the part of the letter that uh, is is different than maybe the way I would sometimes invest in. So, yes. well, but could, can you I mean, these people the- ask great questions? These people ask great questions because they're knowledgeable, sophisticated investors. And so if I don't come up with my due diligence, I just look stupid as well. Yeah. Couldn't you maybe come up with a letter where it's like high risk? You know, you have your normal thing, which is high risk. So I suppose yeah. a, an additionally high risk portfolio where you just share some of these picks, like the more reckless ones. Well, I mean, we I, I have some high risk. Like I just bought two copper explorers that have an enterprise value of 10 to 15 million or less. Mm. Uh, 
you know, uh, um, private placements. And I put these out there because, you know, I, I know one of the geologists at this one company uh, very well, and he's really good and he lives right there. So that's really good for social license and uh, uh, to keep your finger on the pulse. Uh, and I, I got another one as well in another jurisdiction, big land packages that uh, big companies are interested. And that senior guy there, his, his previous life, he was a, a management for one of these big diversified miners like BHP. So he understands what the majors want too. So um, uh, those ones I'll bring in when I'm confident that this is something that's got some kind of comparative hook. Maybe it's small tonnage, high grade, that's not infrastructurally challenged. Maybe it's big idea, big jurisdiction, you know, uh, sort of play that, uh, that majors would be interested in because they're not coming up with these ideas. So I will bring those in, but I can't have it 100% that either because there's other people that want more liquidity. Like when I talked to this one guy who became a subscriber and he goes, you know, yeah, I, I do like doing the small caps. But when he talks small cap, he's talking about a $2 billion company. <laughs> you know, so, so you true. know, I have to do some of these discussions about what is Newmont doing? Where, what is leverage? What are the royalty companies doing? That sort of stuff. Because in order to understand what's happening where the juniors are, we have to understand not only what's happening with the gold and the commodity market, but we have to understand how what the what the majors are doing, because they and and the intermediates because they would potentially be the acquirers of your junior. So if you find that they're just not acquiring anything, they're not making any money, and they're just not interested, then you owning this M and A play, you know, you're going to have to sit on it for a longer time than you wanted to. Mm. Your uh, journey has now taken you into Argentina. Um, and you mentioned Brazil as well. What's the what's the sentiment on South America? Uh, again, a bit of that it's a vague question because it's a huge place. So maybe we can take it step by step. But yeah, talk to me about any of the countries you're excited on. Well, I mean, in, over the last couple of years, I mean, I've been to Argentina looking at projects, but also visiting because my wife's family's from here. Uh, I've been to Chile, went to Chile Explore, looked at a bunch of copper projects there. Uh, water is a big issue, obviously still there. And, you know, the lithium uh, 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 expropriation, let's call it. Uh, nationalization is a big topic. Uh, Peru, infrastructure, slow permitting, um, still endowment, but uh, challenges still. Uh, and then uh, Brazil, um, you know, good infrastructure and everything like that. Uh, that seemed to be more of what I was interested. Guyana, been to that one to see that. And then, you know, this Essequibo thing came out of nowhere just recently um, with uh, with Venezuela trying to make a, a, a play for, to, to change the boundaries, uh, uh, the, the eastern boundary between Venezuela and Guyana. Uh, so... A lot of different things happening in, uh, in, 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 in South America. Each country is different. Uh, you know, right now I would, I would probably put my thumbs up for, for Brazil. Hmm. Argentina infrastructurally is still a bit challenged. Uh, I know there's a new uh, president now and a lot of people are talking about the mining industry being a big winner with, with him. Uh, but I don't see projects that have yet to be permitted in Chubut like Navidad getting permitted. I don't see projects, let's say in Mendoza, uh, getting permitted still, um, you know, because that's all provincial. That's got nothing to do with the federal government. The federal government can make it easier for companies to operate in the country with respect to, you know, getting money out and things like that, or, you know, putting a federal royalty on things or anything like that. They can make that easier, but they can't change the way this, the individual provinces act. Salta, Jujuy, uh, San Juan, Santa Cruz will still be the best provinces in Argentina to operate. Uh, the other ones like Chubut and like Mendoza and some others will still be problematic. They won't change. Hmm. What did you What did you like the most from the jurisdictions you visited this year? Not specifically Argentina, but... Yeah, I mean, like I said, like Brazil uh, stood out for me. Uh, and then also, like, looking at the U.S., 
uh, you know, but dealing with the issues of private versus public uh, exposure, touching waters of the United States or not touching waters of the United States. So if you can get a good play within the U.S., it's still a good place to be. And you'll always find access to capital for projects in the U.S. and, and, and Canada. Uh, Mexico is getting more problematic with the change in mining reforms. But I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, full disclosure, that's also a problem now in BC, which uh, 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 the uh, BC Supreme Court uh, has asked the province to go back and relook at the way that they that people get mineral tenure there. Um, uh, Europe, we've seen some of the problems with some lithium projects there right now in uh, in Spain, uh, and that's really jurisdictional as well. And you have know, the Iberian pyrite belt. A lot easier to permit than, than other places in Spain. Uh, so, yeah, each place has its nuances and understanding those nuances and not putting a sort of stamp like, oh, all of this is OK. I don't like this jurisdiction. But if you dig into it, yeah, well, these parts of it are good. Like, I mean, Panama came from nowhere, I believe, for first quantum and Franco. You know, uh, it's, uh, with respect to the investment, my, my question was, where was this angst or the anxiety about this project when they were spending $7 billion building it? <laughs> where did that come from? You know, was that all hidden? Did nobody ask anybody? It, I mean, that's what makes me question due diligence. Here's First Quantum. Here's Franco. Uh, here's the, you know, the banks that gave them money. You know, didn't anybody see this coming? I mean, this is not like six years down the road into the operation. This is like just going commercial and getting uh, you know less than a year into the production when you're really making money. Mm. And then this happens? Like, I mean, uh, th that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, yeah. somebody had to do something. Mm. Yeah. I would have thought that maybe Argentina was very attractive to you right now with the new president. Um, yeah. More so than other jurisdictions, maybe. Argentina, with respect to lithium in the northern western part, is still attractive. I don't think that's changed. It's probably gotten better under the federal government. But, you know, that's not going to change infrastructure, getting things concentrate out, going east. Because now there's still no agreement between sending concentrates to the west. Mm. So, so you know, like let's take McEwen Mining uh, or their cop McEwen Copper, I guess it's called. With their with their Los Azules project in in uh, in Argentina, they were going to produce concentrate, so I was kind of concerned about that. But now they're actually producing cathode, and that's a win because that cathode could go straight into car manufacturers in Argentina because Argentina, you know, and Brazil are big manufacturing countries. You know, uh, great they don't make EVs. And that was another funny thing is when I was in Brazil, I was at a mining conference called a Dimba in Brasilia. And, um, was, you know, the mining minister was there. So there was a lot of, you know, positive momentum for mining there in Brazil. But weirdly, you know, I was talking to them, you know, like BYD is a big, um, you know, copper, uh, sorry, uh, uh, EV manufacturing company in China. They're making investments in Chile to build a battery plant there. Why? Because they want access to the lithium in the Solar de Atacama. And now Chile's asking for more downstream value add. Brazil's asking for the same. So now China, BYD is investing in a battery plant there. Why? Because they can get the lithium from the spodumene, uh, hard rock dikes. They can also get uh, phosphate and they can get iron ore. So they can make the LFP batteries there. Hmm. But then I said, well, you're making LFP batteries here. You guys are big manufacturers. Why don't you just make EV cars here? Nobody wants them. Hmm. There's no demand for EV cars there. Wow. And that's what people have to, you know, understand is that even though we talk about 100% penetration, we talk about 2035, 2040, that there's not going to be any internal combustion engines. That's just not the reality. Even in the U.S., there's just no way you're going to get 100% penetration. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so we got to understand this when we talk about uh, electric vehicles and all this other stuff because uh, the demand there is a constraint there not only with infrastructure for the evs power but also cost uh you know because if you have a car that's made in china 
or the parts come from one of these countries that they don't like, you don't get that EV credit. And when your EV costs 50, 60 grand, and you don't get that credit, you might not buy that car. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, but it, at the same time, it's making me think about sort of a, a triple combo here, if you will. Well, it's not a combo if it's triple. What is it called? I'm having a dumb moment. I've had plenty of those in That's this okay. conversation. I, I don't go to McDonald's much, so I don't know what they call it. <laughs> it's. I'm thinking about Argentina. I'm thinking about Canadian battery producers in Argentina. Um, if like they have big, for example, lithium. because if they have a big project, they're hoping for Chinese takeout, but the Canadian government's not going to allow that. Uh, and the Argentinian government weird, might because block the, the Canadian government has actually got involved in M and A transactions that have happened overseas that have nothing to do with them, mm. just because the company is listed in Canada. So that okay. is a concern. And that's a concern for uranium development in Saskatchewan because a lot of the investments were made by Chinese companies that no longer can take those big footprints in those kind of companies. Yeah. You'll no longer get Chinese M&A in any kind of assets in the Arctic. You know, that's never going to happen mm. uh, jurisdictionally. Uh, they don't want the Chinese to own anything up there. So, you know, uh, you, that was something that happened during the super cycle. I mean, even Guyana, you know, a lot of the M&A there for the gold projects was Chinese. Shandong, you know, a lot of other ones that are buying assets down there. That might be more problematic now. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's a perfect storm, actually. Cause they, well, I mean, you look at the Chinese. Now they're going to places that the West won't go, obviously, uh, like Bolivia. Uh, Solar de Uyuni is a big solar, lots of lithium. But, uh, you know, their problem was the magne uh, magnesium oxide. You know, and that's a problem when you do the big evaporation ponds, you concentrate that deleterious uh, element. But mm. if you do direct lithium extraction and it works, you, that's not a problem. And mm. this is a big asset. It requires a lot of money, a lot, a lot of investment, but a lot of people don't want to make that kind of investment in Bolivia. The Chinese will and are. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I mean, they're probably worried about, uh, are they going to keep getting lithium from uh, Australia? You know, uh, well, where else can they get lithium? They've restarted getting coal from Australia, which is a big one. Australia's yeah. actually started two new coal mines this year, if I'm not mistaken, just to be able to provide the Chinese because they restarted yeah. getting the coal. But, I mean, where is the demand going to come? Like, the West doesn't want that much coal. Mm. Uh, so it's either going to come from India or China. Hmm. You know, uh, so you're going to shoot yourself in the foot for things like coal if if you don't sell it to the Chinese. Because if you just sell it, let's say, to the Indias, they'll screw you because they might be the only demand source you have. And if you just sell it to the Chinese, again, they'll screw you because they're the only place you're going to send it. But now if you have both of them, more competition, the better. Hmm. Again, topics that my brain that uh, deeper than what my brain typically goes into. So I appreciate going into. What is your? Uh, I don't want to keep you up all day though. Um, what is your? What's your portfolio looking right now in terms of percentages? Because uh, we we talked mostly about gold and copper. Is that where it's overweight, or do you have something else as well? Yeah, it's mostly overweight. Uh, let's call them liquid commodities. Uh, that. When I say liquid commodities, there's no one asset that if it's built or goes under that would have a major impact on the supply and demand scenario. And, and, and some other issues might be synthetic forms of the same product, whether it's graphite. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not looking at like even though I have exposure to some smaller markets like uranium, I do have exposure limited. I have some exposure to rare earths, limited, but within the same uranium company. Um, so uh, I, I do have some other exposures to these things, but I don't have 100% in a company. Uh, so if somebody is exploring for lithium, that's fine, as long as they're also exploring for gold and copper. Um, so there's a bit of diversification. It's not a one-trick pony with respect to exploration. Uh, so you want to be in a jurisdiction that's got a great endowment. So, you know, where you find this, you can also find this because 
these structures bring both these types of mineralization. Um, so yeah, but still majority gold, uh, the new things coming in, a lot of it copper spread between exploration, a few development projects uh, and production. Mm. Uh, but the production, like I don't have gold production right now just because my concern about margins. But if, you know, that might, that might change. Mm. And worldwide, where is it? Is it concentrated in one specific spot? Um, or No, um, like we, we definitely have, uh, you know, the U.S., uh, like Nevada and Idaho and uh, Arizona, these kind of companies uh, exploring. But the development play I have there is all private land. Have uh, They have access to water, uh, which is important. Um, and then, you know, uh, we have Brazil, uh, we've got exposure to Australia, uh, and uh, I sold the last one that I had in Europe, I think, uh, and then and then some in Africa. Mm. Um, so it, it, again, management might be uh, commodity first, management, and then stage. Uh, those are the sort of things I think about, and then timing. Okay, yeah. I didn't hear you mention Utah for the U.S., or did you mention it? Utah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do have Utah with respect to uranium. The, the one I sure. think is one of the yeah. I'm right. pushing it now. I know I'm pushing it, but I just... Uh, uh, no, I know what you're talking about, so good enough. I'm, I'm just happy you didn't mention Sweden or Greenland. I'm just happy. Well, Greenland, I think, is problematic. Yeah, I, I think that that's logistically difficult. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's very expensive. And that's another thing we got to think about is when financing becomes problematic, which it has been obviously over the last three quarters, is uh, not only access to capital, but how much you're spending. And so when you, I, and I've sold a few uh, companies that, you know, the projects look interesting, great technical people and all that, but it costs them, you know, $1,000 a meter to drill a hole. Hmm. So they have to, you know, piece together a financing for a million or a million and a half, but it only goes to 1,000, 1,500 meters of drilling when the project really requires 10 to 20,000 meters of drilling. Hmm. You know, uh, that becomes problematic. And so I, I sort of started selling the high cost parts. Like even in the U.S., now uh, diamond drilling costs about 500 bucks a meter, which, Jesus, that's a lot of money. If, if five or six years ago, it would cost you about four hundred dollars a meter Canadian uh, for helicopter supported in the Golden Triangle. Now you're talking a thousand plus. Yeah, is that, is that something you would look at religiously? Like what the? I mean, how much importance do you but, place? Well, on especially that? now when financing risk is so paramount, because mm. then I'm getting less bang for buck. Good point. Fair enough. Sure. Okay. Okay. What else? What else caught your attention in uh, 2024? What was sort of your uh, mo most favorite story? Yeah, I think we talked about central bank gold buying, all time highs. We talked about a lot of stuff. What, what caught your attention the most? Oh, God. Uh, let me think. Uh, I guess problematically was, you know, the, the dichotomy between this push for critical minerals without understanding processing without understanding how things get built, how things are mined at the same time as that you want this green future that you're pushing for, but you're not permitting the projects or allowing for that independence within your own jurisdiction. So mm. even you're saying, Hey, you know, we want all this, but then you turn around and you don't permit that project. Um, you know, do you really want it? And then you go out to another country where you don't have the same parameters, let them build it, let them use coal fired plants to power it, let them use diesel, um, you know, uh, because it's not in my backyard, but I'll get the copper or I'll get the lithium or I'll get the battery, you know. So th that sort of uh, hypocrisy has always uh, interested me. And then the whole thing about critical minerals, I mean, uh, you know, do we understand the demand pull? Do we, is electric vehicle penetration 100% really what we want? You know, how much power is that going to require? Are we just switching power needs? So, yeah, I've got an EV car, but it's being powered by a diesel plant. 
you know, uh, how many EV cars did I see in Whitehorse? You know, uh, even though they're all about critical minerals, but I mean, problematically, I mean, it's, it's hard. Mm. It's cold. There's not enough power. And when it's really freezing, sometimes these things just don't charge. Yeah. You know, are you really comfortable going out in the sticks knowing you've only got 400 kilometers of capacity in your battery? You know, that would be good, uh, 400 kilometers. What happened to me is that uh, in 2020, when I got an EV, I was I was sold onto it happily. I had a um, a, a risk. It was a greater than <laughs> no. I mean, it was a, it was a risk free thing for me because I financed it on a green loan for my company. Yeah. Luckily, I got rid of the car within, I believe, nine days or something like that because it was advertised with 480 kilometers of range. I could not get more than 190 kilometers out of it. And when I called to ask what's happening, you know, what, what, what's up with the range, they told me not to uh, use the seat heating. They told me not to use the navigation. Oh, yeah. But you have to use the navigation to prepare the battery for charging. It's a mess. Uh, and, you know, I'm thinking about, and I, I don't live in that cold of a place. It was December, so it was like five degrees out celsius yeah. that is so cold ish but not cold i mean if there's someone from alberta listening to this they're gonna laugh with me you know these guys get like yeah. minus 20 or whatever they get so how, how do you get these how do you get penetration into those markets and something i think about a lot and there's a lot of assumptions that i see online regarding electric vehicles that kind of worry me but yeah well the other thing is the battery itself because the battery is such a big part like i mean we talk about internal combustion engines we talk about the parts and all that but now we take all that stuff out and we just have this battery and then the thing is that when the battery goes what happens mm. you know because you know you could drive an ice car like for 10 years you know once that battery goes in six years what happens i mean the car might still work but you need a new battery but what happens is that the car is worth nothing now because the battery you have to replace. Yeah. But the cost of the battery is such a big part of the car. The car might be worth nothing, but just to buy the battery is almost as much as buying a new EV. Yeah. Because the battery itself might be 40 grand. That was a big consideration for me uh, for, for, for selling it, really. Um, because like it, it's funny, they normally say that the car a car loses most of its value once it drives off the lot, right? Yeah. That's what they say. Not true for EVs. Uh, I mean, if I had kept it to now, three years later, exactly three years actually, I would have lost because I lost money obviously on the, on on that whole fiasco on those nine days or something. Not as much as I would have lost if I had kept it. Yeah. So it's it's a real issue. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody wants to buy them. I see these articles constantly, but I mean, who would want to buy a five six year old EV? So. And, and the other problem is that the whole idea is to consume less. You know, but, yeah. but what we're doing is building bigger cars that require bigger batteries. So we want to build a Ford F-150 and, and make it battery. And you're thinking, well, I don't think that's that's the idea behind the battery thing, you know, because you want to do less emissions, but you just don't want to have a big battery guzzling car. The idea is to have something smaller and, you know, more modest. Mm -hmm. But then... The thing is that the, the mentality that buys a Ford F-150 is not the mentality that buys an electric vehicle. It's mm. not the same mindset. Yeah. They're not thinking about charging their vehicle. They're just thinking about putting gas in it and off they go. Yeah. You know? It was another big and, issue for me because I live in an apartment. And so charging it was a hell as well. Um, oh. But they're always full. The charges were always full, even in a country like Belgium where um, – you would expect to have more options and whatnot. And then sure there's charging on the street, uh, but then there's always somebody there. They're always, well, I mean, charging is a, it's a, it's a big issue coming from a, you know, a diesel vehicle myself where you just drive to the gas station, you keep driving in, in, you know, what is it? Two, three, four, five minutes. Well, not the case. It was horrible. Yeah. The other thing is actually charging. And so these guys go to these charging stations and then, you know, when you're in a gas station, you fill up, it, you know, it takes you five minutes. I mean, you could be sitting there for two, three hours yeah. to charge your vehicle. And you go, well, what the hell? I mean, I got things I could be doing. Now, you know? That's exact. And you're not supposed to because the car I was charging had like an, an iPad thing where you can watch movies. You're not supposed to watch movies while charging because that drains the battery, slows down the pr – it makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing makes no sense to me. I was uh, – uh, yeah, I'm not – I was not happy with it. My, my my other uh, consternation about this was the jump from internal combustion engines 
all the way to 100% EV, you know, plug-in cars, as opposed to hybrids. I agree. Because hybrids, you get the in, you don't require that infrastructure. Most of what we drove, like my wife's got a hybrid. You know, you, you don't drive more than a couple of, you know, 20 kilometers a pop. You know, you, you're dropping the kids off, going to the grocery store. Most of your driving is that. You're not making 500 kilometer trips every day. But, I mean, you can charge enough of that that you don't have to fill up your tank. You know, you, you fill it up once a month, once every three weeks, as right. opposed to every three or four days. I mean, that's a huge component. But we got right off of that kick. And, you know, that's got less infrastructure issues less pull from critical minerals in terms of, oh, where are we going to get the critical minerals for? And, you know, those vehicles last longer, the batteries are smaller. Yeah. You know, it, it, it just, I mean, it, it would allow for more transition. And if you still wanted a full electric vehicle where it made sense, go for your life, buy one. But don't impose this 100% EV on me, you know, because I want the flexibility. I don't live where you live. You know, I, I don't have, I don't want that at risk of, you know, running out of power. I don't want the risk of, you know, in six years that this battery is going to be worthless and I got to buy a new one, but it's not going to be cheap. Mm. You know, you're not going to get a used battery. You know, it's not like you get a Duracell and charge it with this bunny rabbit. It's, it's like, it's, it's just not going to work. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I've got problems with this. You know, in terms of how this the end game actually looks, and my bigger problem is that there's not a lot of thought going into it. Yeah, well, well control what you can control in the end, right? I mean, you you do what you what's right for you in terms of what which car you have, and also what's right for your portfolio. So, but what's all? I, I assume you don't necessarily have exposure to battery metals, do you? Yes, I do. Hmm. Uh, like lithium, like uh, in terms of exploration, rare earths, uh, copper. Mm. Uh, rare earths no. is an interesting one because china what is it last week or the week before that they announced that they're now completely cutting off the supply of gallium germanium um you mentioned brazil brazil's moving forward with uh rare earths i saw it today or yesterday something along those lines yeah those something. ionic clay deposits yeah exactly. uh th but those are like um uh, heavy rare earths like the ndprs uh and i think uh, dytb dysprosium and tiborium or something like that mm. and then you Dimium and Prasadium, uh, those are the ones you want. Um, that sort of market, you really got to know metallurgy. The mining part isn't the difficult part. It's the metallurgy. Uh, and so you really have to know that the management team have that kind of understanding. And then, you know, when you look at an assay, the assay has to be done at a specific pH level. So usually when you, pee, when you do this, you need to do it at a pH level of four and you want to ask them to make sure it's done like that because if you do it at a lower pH level, higher level of acidity, you'll get more deleterious elements. You'll show that the rare earth recovery is better, but that's not the recovery, that's not the acid level you would use for the actual metallurgical recovery. So those are things you need to understand when you do a lot of the critical minerals and it's really a lot about metallurgy uh, and uh, uh, people have to dig into that uh, even at the exploration stage to, to understand if it works or not. Mm. So what, you're not going up to Greenland? No, I, I'd love to go. I'd love to go, but I mean, it would be a total, uh, like, I mean, I, I wouldn't go there with the idea that I would actually invest in anything, but I always like to go to new places. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, no, it's, it's nothing. Uh, nothing I, I would probably consider. Mm. Fair point. Um, okay, yeah. Well, we've been through a whole lot. I don't know. Um, what was it? Yeah. Well, what's the what's the thing you're looking forward to the most? I wrote it down as you were speaking because I wanted to ask you what's the thing that impressed you the most in 2024 or caught your attention in 2023? Excuse me. What caught your attention the most in 2023? And then I wanted to ask you what are you looking forward to the most in 2024 in terms of macroeconomic developments or anything else in the mining and metal space what else well i think we're all looking for you know these this this declining uh, peak real rates which will help precious metals and let's see if that leverage continues into the gold mm. sector and that's what people are putting a lot of their money on and then also the issues that we were talking about with respect to copper 
Uh, now people are forecasting deficits as early as uh, the latter part of 24, when before the deficits were more like in 27, 28. Uh, so that's something else I'm watching. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, what projects actually get built? Like the other thing is M&A. Like we, we've seen some M&A in the gold sector, but sometimes it's not been at the premium we'd liked. Uh, we did see Dundee uh, uh, Biocino, but that was done at a decent premium. And that uh, was done half cash. And we haven't seen a lot of M&A in any part of any sector that's been done uh, with cash for a long time. And so that was good. Granted, DPM, uh, Dundee Precious Metal had, had, had the cash to give. I don't know if they needed to offer it as if there were multiple bids for Asino. I don't know if that's the case. But definitely the Asino transaction was much better than, let's say, the Marathon tracks action with Calibre with the premium they got. Uh, you know, uh, that looked much more attractive. And if that's the way that, that it's going to go into 2024, that, that, that's, that's a good sign. Mm. good well let's uh let's pick this up in 2024 sometime and see whatever else is happening yeah, i'm all out of questions this was a great discussion what else am i missing something else that you want to add here at the end yeah i mean just i mean uh the thing is that we continue to go on a lot of, a lot of site visits i mean last year we did a lot in south america and peru chile uh a bit in argentina and brazil uh egypt uh, and I'm looking forward to getting to Saudi hopefully uh, next year and uh, potentially Australia uh, in, in February. Um, and so, yeah, it, I'm always learning. You never stop learning, always seeing new things. And it, it's it's still a lot of fun to get out in the field. Uh, like when I went into uh, Peru, into the jungle, I hate the jungle and I hate snakes. But yeah, there, there was a snake that came out. I mean, I, I, everywhere I went, it was like, where was I putting my hands? And this is jungle terrain, steep. It was like, it's like Ecuador. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just hard. Uh, and, and then, and then you, you sort of, the guy is up there screaming snake. And they go, oh, great. You know, and then you go there, he's got it in his hands. And he's saying, well, is it poisonous? No. And he just throws it back. And then this other one, we were coming down. I, I was telling this guy, he says, oh, you know, we saw a snake in this Place. And he goes, oh, you'll love this next place. There's lots of snakes there. And I went, oh, great. Thank you. We went there. And usually they say, like, it's the third or fourth person that gets bitten by the snake. It was the 15th person that went by the snake that actually got attacked. But thankfully, it was a local who knew what he was doing. Uh, and then he told me that, okay, this is a small one. Very long. And, uh, and you know, they call it, you know, like a... I don't know, a three hour snake or something like that, because once you get bit, you got about three hours. Mm. Uh, so yeah, fun stuff, uh, <laughs> exciting. And uh, yeah, we still enjoy doing it. And uh, yeah, uh, that's what, uh, uh, what, you know, keeps me going here at Exploration Insights. Right. That's explorationinsights.com. How are you, how much are you charging to get bitten by snakes? Uh, we're charging more now. Uh, <laughs> because of the now, snakes? Well, yeah, I can't die. It's it's a bad look. Mm. Uh, it, it's a monthly subscription, one hundred seventy dollars uh, U.S. Uh, per month. Uh, and, you know, to to learn about not just the snakes, but something about rocks. And we go into a bit more detail about individual assets, just like this interview, which I love these long forms because you can dig into the into the weeds here. Uh, and that's what we do uh, when I start talking about companies. Um, we get into the weeds about what we see, what we think is problematic. And um, it, it's not it's not like like risk is bad. That's not the question. The risk is that is it that the risk you want to take? Mm. You know, and you just need to understand the risks. Mm. You don't want to avoid them. You don't want to say, oh, I, that's too risky. But what is that risk? And is it the comfortable risk? Like immediately with an expiration play, the absolute risk you're willing to take and you should be willing to take is the drill bit. Do they hit what they think they're going to hit? That's the risk I'm willing to take. What I'm not willing to take is, uh, you know, uh, uh, share dilution because of a bad transaction. Uh, uh, you know, inability to gain social license because they did something wrong. Uh, you know, weak access to capital markets, 
uh, you know, all these sort of things that management sort of mitigating should mitigate that I'm betting on management and that might be my fault for not picking the correct management team. Uh, but, you know, those are the sort of risks you got to think about. Uh, and the way to mitigate those the best is not just pick the best jurisdiction because you can still have problems is to pick the people that understand all these risks and mm -hmm. they're the best people to mitigate them. And that's why we go back to management and understand that those are the people that they are the chief executive risk mitigator. That's what we're trying for. They mm -hmm. can't eliminate a risk. You know, it's hard to eliminate risk. What you need to do is mitigate it. Yeah. And, and people that do simulation like I used to do, some of these people that did it were comfortable thinking that they were actually mitigating risk by simulating it on all you're doing is quantifying it you know uh, you're trying to get an idea of what it could be but that doesn't stop it from happening mm. uh, it just makes you more aware of what you should be aware of uh, so yeah th th that's the sort of thing people got to understand in this environment and, and then the problem is that you need those years in the industry to know who knows what and is their experience actually valid for what they're doing now? Uh, and that's the connection you got to make during your discussion with the management. These kind of interviews that you have, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing, you got to get comfortable with management because that's what you'll be stuck with. And, and you want to be compensated for risk. That's also one of my my other main takeaways from twenty twenty three is that I don't. I want to be. I want to know that I'm paying you know, a, a fair amount for the fair amount of risk that I'm, well, I want to be paying, you know, an, an underpriced amount for, for the amount of risk that I'm taking, basically. Yeah, you don't want to be paying 100 million bucks in market cap for an exploration company that, you know, can only drill 1500 meters a year, uh, you know, uh, and they haven't really had any results. Yeah, you want to pay like $5 million, and hopefully they'll hit something. Mm -hmm. But then if they don't hit anything, that's okay. You know, because uh, that was the risk. And for, for people who think that all these high reward things will actually generate the high reward are kidding themselves. Most of them will just generate the uh, the, the high risk yeah. of the equation. But the drill bit is the important risk that you should be willing to expose yourself to. Everything else you want to diminish as much as possible. Mitigate either by selecting jurisdictions, by selecting certain commodities, by selecting certain management teams. That's your job. But you can't know what's there unless they're just redrilling an old hole, which a lot of people do. Uh, if you're really doing true grassroots, you're going to underexplored places where if they find something, that's really where you get that five plus bagger. Right. And, and, and again, you want to be compensated for all of that because I, I recently had a deal across my desk. Um, it's a private company, but they're raising money at a $5 million valuation. And you can think, oh, $5 million market cap. That's really low. That's cheap. I want to take it. But you don't know that they, they don't like they don't have drill targets. For example, way too early stage. A bunch of things can go wrong before the drill bit thing goes wrong, and so I want to be compensated for that risk before taking the drill bit risk as well. And so, you know, I'd, I'd make them a count offer, a counter offer for, without trying to insult them for two million dollar, and they wouldn't take it. Well, then that's that. That deal is not for me, and then you move on. So, yeah, you got to have the ability to say no. Uh, that, that's that's for sure. Uh, but but the other thing is you got to think that if. You know that if you if it's a five million enterprise value stock, and then you could see well just with what they have, and I could do a comparable on another project and another management team that've got exactly the same thing, and and they're worth four times as much. Well, just just them going to conferences and talking about the company and what kind of grades they're getting, that will get them automatically a double. You're thinking. So the next time they raise, they'll raise twice the price that I came in on. So you don't have a problem with them raising money. You just don't want their next raise to be half the price that you paid. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
uh, another question that I ask in that case is, is how much did you pay for your shares? Because often they paid, you know, a dollar for a million shares. Uh, and if, if, I'm, if I'm coming in at 10 cents, um, that's something that I'm also not necessarily willing to take because I'm, I'm, I'm the exiting liquidity. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, that's, that's a good point because when people say, oh, insiders own 10%, well, you know, what? how much did you spend to get that 10%? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's fine if it was next to nothing. Okay, but I know that, yeah, you're insiders, you own this much, but really you'd sell it even if it was 10 cents because you didn't pay anything for it. Mm. You know, uh, and then I look at, you know, what who's who's come in? Like, where did institutional equity come in? Where did private equity come in? And if I could come in at a lower price than them, that's good because then I don't have any selling pressure for them coming in and saying, oh, you know, we made five times. We're, we're leaving as you're coming in through your door. I'm exiting, coming out the other door. Yeah, Those are the other things, uh, you know, I'd, I'd want to know with respect mm. to, oh, and then they say, oh, you know what, uh, this big company owns 5% of me. And then you go, well, is that a proactive investment or was that a divestment? So then if you dig into it, it's, oh, yeah, that big company owns me because I didn't have any cash to pay for the asset, so I gave them my shares. So for me, that's an overhang that these guys are sellers. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the quicker they can mitigate that overhang, I might be tempted to wait until that overhang is taken care of. Because yeah. timing, as you know, is, is, is paramount to making any money in this. Yeah, that's another good point. A lot Because we see a lot of these deals – in times in the market when it's hard to raise capital, juniors would make deals with with majors to to get money for their assets to explore them and stuff like that. But you also do you just want to keep asking those questions like how involved is this major? Like if it's Newmon, do they really care about you or are are they really you know just in you to 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 put hours on the clock or something like that? Do they keep coming in on financings? Like if they if they own a portion of the company. And they have a JV on it, and they keep coming in on financings. Yeah, that's a different story. Uh, but if you know, for example, there was some sort of an exit, they got ten percent of your company like four years ago, and now they've dive, uh, they they've been diluted down to four percent, and the company is still gonna advertise that four percent again. Uh, going back to everything being marketing material, well, that four percent does it really mean anything? That's it's a very good point. Well, that you an make. example, a recent example. Uh, you know, EMX royalty. I mean, so uh, they bought uh, from SSR Mining a big royalty portfolio, included projects in South America and Peru, I think, and then Turkey. They've got some really good royalties there. And so I think it was half cash, half shares. And so SSR and Mining ended up owning, you know, whatever, 9 to 10% of EMX. But, I mean, they only own it because, uh, you know, that's how they got – that, that was part of the consideration for the asset. And so it, it's it was technically an overhang. And so just recently, SSR Mining sold that position to a bank, Scotia, and Scotia has sold it to their clients. So that is a good thing because some of that overhang has now been taken off, off of VMX because now it's in the hands of more long-term shareholders that own it because they want exposure to EMX as opposed to they own it for consideration for compensation for another asset. So that that's that was a positive in terms of trying to get rid of some of that overhang that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, well that's a good point. That's a uh, quite quite a different scenario actually, something that I didn't think about. So uh, yeah, good point. Good Joe, this has been again this has been great exploration insights dot com for people looking to learn more there's a bunch of free content on there your media is on there if people want to watch more interviews or whatnot and uh yeah thanks again so much for investing your time in me and uh happy new year